bear with us. The hardest part about setting up the meeting is getting the, the electronics working in the back. We good? <laughs> All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Thursday, uh, November 14th meeting of the Weathersfield Planning and Zoning Commission. Would the uh, clerk help me with the roll call, please? Chairman Harley. I am here. Uh, Vice Chair Roberts. Here. I'm here. Ms. Hughes. Wickle. Here. Mr. Hammer. Here. Mr. Omicki. No. Mr. Dean. Here. Mr. Silver. Here. Mr. Edwards. Ms. Antoniak. No. Uh, Ms. Murphy. No. All right. So thank you. Uh, we have seven members here. Uh, you need a majority. It's normally nine. We strive to have nine. So you have to have a majority um, voting in favor of an applicant in order for it to pass. So in other words, you need five positive votes for an, for an application to pass, all right? That's a basic premise. Um, let's, before I give a, another spiel, let's move on to item 3.1. It's application 2025-19-Z, uh, the pay dress seeking a special permit. Peter, would you? The, <coughs> excuse me, the applicant has uh, requested that this uh, matter be tabled um, to the first meeting in December. Uh, they have submitted a, uh, an extension uh, consent for that. Uh, they still have not received an answer from DOT, and they are scheduled to meet with the Design Review uh, Committee next week. So um, they should be in a good position for the December 3rd meeting. All right. Th thank you. Could I have a motion, please? Make a motion. We continue public hearing on 202519Z to December 3rd, 2019, here at 7 p.m. Thank you, George. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Item passes. So, item 3-2, would you like to introduce it? Application number 2027-19-Z, WAG time, play, and stay, <coughs> C, seeking a special permit uh, for accessory building structures of Weathersfield, uh, according to the Weathersfield zoning regulations to convert a portion of a parking lot to an outdoor kennel area at 60 Beaver Road. Thank you. Would the applicant join us at the microphone? And, and while that's taking place, let me describe for the public the way this process works. <clears throat> so uh, the applicant is going to take some time to describe what is proposed, and the commission is going to listen and then have questions. And when we feel comfortable that some of our, you know, most of our questions have been answered, we're going to turn and ask for input from the public, uh, and that'll be your turn. And then we'll take it back from the public and you know, continue our questioning with the applicant, trying to get you some answers, that kind of stuff. And uh, the way the process would work beyond that is that if we feel like we have everything we need to make a decision, we'll close the public hearing process and we will continue to dialogue and, and potentially take a vote. If, however, there's more to be uh, gathered and more that we have asked for, or you, that maybe you have asked for, and the applicant needs to come back, we may um, continue the hearing to a, a subsequent meeting, like you just heard the last uh, item on our agenda, we continued it to another meeting in the future. That might happen if we need some additional information, some additional input. And, uh, and then we would do the same thing the second night, ga gather more information. When we feel like we have enough, we would make a decision. All righty? Everybody generally clear enough on how the process works? All righty. So would the applicant uh, introduce yourself and describe what the proposal is about? Yeah, go ahead, grab that. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, and also members of the audience. My name is Robin Pearson. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Alter and Pearson in Glastonbury, Connecticut, and I represent the applicant for the special permit application that's before you this evening. <coughs> um, the individuals that comprise the uh, applicant, which is an LLC, are Brian and Jeffrey Cousins. They are both brothers. And uh, between them, in one configuration or another, uh, they represent the owner of the property at 60 Beaver Road and the business known as Wag Time Play and Stay. Zenu Realty LLC is the property owner and the applicant in the application that you have for special permit approval. We've requested two special permits. One is for a um, accessory use, which is to allow the outdoor fenced-in dog care area or play area outside of the 60 Beaver Road um, dog care facility. 
and the other is a request for an accessory structure, which is a sound attenuation fence um, that we propose uh, be able to be built behind the facility, uh, basically in response to the concerns that have been raised. The two sections that are implicated in your regulations are 5.3.A14 and 5.B.6. And I just want to, before we get into any of the specifics of the application, and particularly this is to those in the audience who have uh, come before this commission and come before the town council and raise concerns about noise issues, I want you to know and to be able to assure you that we can resolve the noise issue that has been raised by you if this application is pro approved tonight or when it, or the commission finally closes the hearing and makes a decision on the application. So I think we're starting off with good news for you and I will now proceed to get into the history of how we got to this particular point in time and what we can do to um, allay your concerns. Um, the cousins are here this evening and can address any uh, questions that the commission may have um, directly, but we're not going to ask them to come up and participate in the actual presentation. I'd just like to go through a little bit of the background um, that went into allowing uh, WAG time to be uh, located at this particular location and to describe the process that resulted in the um, permitting that got them to this point and before you now. At that, once I've gone through that, Kevin Peterson, who is our acoustical engineer from SHA Acoustics and whose report you already have in your materials, will bring down the screen and we'll go through the specifics of his analysis and his suggested um, resolution through sound attenuation with regard to the barking. And then following that, I'd like to discuss our response to the town engineer's comments as well as any next steps. Uh, you did get a, uh, an engineer's report on, I think it was Saturday, it was Saturday it came in on November 8th. So let me tell you a little bit about the history and, and what I've come to learn about uh, WAG time, uh, play and stay. Uh, Brian Cousins, um, one of the owners and uh, one of the brothers lives in Wethersfield where he's lived for 12 years. He needs very familiar with the Beaver Road area. And he began thinking about um, a doggy daycare boarding business in Wethersfield along with his brother as far back as 2014. He met with staff back in 2015 to discuss the potential and permitting for another venture but that fell through. And I mention that only because the cousins have long recognized the need to work with town officials up front to get all the issues on the table and make sure that a project makes sense and can work before proceeding to invest in a particular project. And that is a good thing. Meeting with town staff and administration is always a good thing because they understood their limits. <coughs> and they also recognize that Wethersfield staff is very professional, helpful, and would give them a fair analysis of the prospects for approval and what would be needed to get there. By 2017, they had a business plan for establishing the doggy daycare and stay area, and they began looking for possible properties. Um, Brian Cousins saw the for sale sign outside of the veterinarian facility at 60 Beaver Road and he was familiar with it because, and knew that they also boarded dogs because he had taken his dog there. And uh, he was very interested. A realtor showed the facility to them back in 2017, but someone else actually entered into a contract to purchase the building on the same day that they went through and saw it. But ultimately that sale fell through uh, the realtor came back to the cousins. They did a marketing analysis that substantiated that there is a clear need for a service like they were interested in setting up at this location in Wethersfield. And I think it's fair to say based on the uh, significant number of letters from people, um, mostly Wethersfield residents, who use the WAG time facility now and uh, 
very much appreciated being there that there is indeed a need for this. Uh, if I know we emailed you those letters. I will leave with you 16 copies of the pile of letters also should you prefer to leaf through them as paper copies. So on December 18th of 2018, towards the end of the year, um, Brian Cousins emailed to uh, Peter Gillespie to describe the communications he had had with other town officials about the possible purchase and establishment of doggy daycare at 60 Beaver Road. Um, I was going to read it into the record, and I don't think I will do that because it'll take a while, but I will leave copies with you. And the reason I, I read it or allude to parts of it is because it indicates my client was very careful about making sure that they dotted their T's and, no, dotted their I's and crossed their T's and did all that would be necessary to make sure that this would be an acceptable um, business going forward. Uh, I know that one of the issues with regard to how this has all evolved is uh, concentrated on the fact that there was never a site plan that was submitted that showed the doggy daycare play area outside behind the building. That is true, but I want everybody, including people in the audience who are upset about how this has gotten to the point that it is today where they had to come before you and ask for some help with relieving um, the, the noise issue or concerns that they have. I just want you to know that um, there was never any intent to hide that, that my clients did acknowledge to staff that indeed there would be a play area in back and specifically from this December 18th memo, um, Mr. Cousins indicated, and I'll read part of it, we do not need to do much to the building since it was a functional vet. However, uh, he didn't say however. We would need to erect a fence off the back for an outside play area and obviously renovate the interior to suit our needs. The roof does need to be replaced as well as some fresh softscape and landscaping. And he goes on to talk about people he'd already met within the town staff and uh, how he'd like to come in and meet and further um, about business opportunities, maybe, um, and any other issues that should be considered before they purchase the building. So I would like to leave those with you just for the record because I don't want anybody to think that my client or the applicant was trying to hide something from anyone with regard to the need for it's an in integral part of the doggy daycare uh, or wag time play and stay program is to have that outdoor play area it's like a it's like a recess area for children and at a playground or behind a school it the business does not operate if the dogs cannot be allowed to play outside um, during the day and that's why people who bring their dogs to uh, wag time go there because it has that type of facility. Uh, Brian did meet with the planner and Justin Lafon Lafontaine, the then CEO, around February of 2018 to discuss a list of items and next steps regarding permitting and one of the items on that list, and I'll leave that for you also, was the desired fence. I do have notes from that meeting and uh, it was clear that a fence was something that was on the list of items to be discussed um, with the planning staff, and I believe the ZEO, yes, and the ZEO was there. Um, there is no indication as to any direction that was given to my client for further pro permitting with regard to that fence. That said, in February of 2018, they purchased the property and the building it was a major investment for them. They spent over half a million dollars to buy that property. In April uh, of 2018, they secured zoning sign-offs um, from the um, town planner at that time, who I believe was acting as the zoning enforcement officer because those sign-offs are required for state permitting. Um, they needed to get a <laughs> commercial kennel license and a training facility license from the state of Connecticut. State of Connecticut does not regulate 
um, operations such as they don't have a license for doggy daycare. They're regulated under the kennel, the commercial kennel and training facility licenses. Um, you have a report from your town planner in the uh, package of materials which indicates and goes through all the permitting that did take place with regard to the use uh, by the prior owner for 60 Beaver Road as initially an animal hospital, but also it was in 1987 acknowledged that it was a commercial or a kennel and that the kennel use was authorized there. The uh, veterinarian at that time did board dogs at the premises. So, I mean, it, it very reasonable to uh, have wag time consider this location as suitable for what they were proposing to do. It, it was certainly substantiated with regard to previous permitting um, such that staff was able to say that the use was permitted and allowed and with all of that, um, the applicant proceeded. The applicant did not submit a site plan and it was because the applicant is not a land use lawyer or someone who has done this in the past, did not understand or know that a site plan was required. Had a site plan been submitted at that time, perhaps the issue would have risen more to the fore and we would not be here several months later after the opening um, to deal with this particular issue. But we are here now and uh, I think we're ready to at least be able to give you some good news as to how to address the issue that has arisen. arisen. Um, in February of 2018 to July of 2018, they worked on fixing up the property. Uh, they converted it to accommodate um, doggy play areas both inside and outside. Uh, the state inspected in June of 2018 and approved the, uh, the layout. In July, they had a uh, soft opening. Uh, that was about a year and four months ago. And during that soft opening period, July 2018, they did things like begin to take clients in, client dogs in, and train staff and get their operations on, in order and make sure everything was working correctly. Um, at that time, during that period, they had approximately uh, 20 to 25 dogs at a given time. In the very beginning, until the fence went up and back, they were walking the dogs um, on leashes to make sure that, because obviously they, didn't, they weren't enclosed anywhere. In July of 2018, the fence was installed to close off the play area, and soon thereafter, all the dogs were let outside to play during the day. So dogs have been playing outside in that play area since August of 2018, which is more than a year or so ago, and more than a year and what, four months ago. It wasn't until January 25th, beginning of this year, that they had a grand opening and ribber, ribbon cutting. Um, they held it during midday. It was very festive. A lot of people came. Uh, everybody seemed very... Uh, please, dogs were playing outside while that was going on. Um, many town officials were there. Um, it was a very positive vibe. So at that point, no one thought we had any issues that hadn't been addressed to make sure that this business could proceed and operate with the outdoor <coughs> play area. Um, my client indicates that they became aware of the issue in March of 2019 when the police were called about the noise and since then, the complaints have come in, and that is what we're here to try and address for you tonight. Um, we're not going to say that there is no issue uh, that needs to be addressed. We're not going to say that, or try and rationalize that dog barking um, is something that maybe should be tolerated because it is sporadic and their protocols indicate that they take the dogs in as best they can when the dogs, when some dogs get a little um, <coughs> overly excited and yapping becomes a little stronger barking. Um, or because the sound, we're not going to say that this isn't a problem because dogs that are playing sound a lot better or are, it's not an, 
unhappy sound. It's not an aggravating sound in the same way it might be with a dog at the end of its leash and left outside for long periods of time. Um, there is a level of noise disturbance that should be addressed, and we acknowledge that. We did undertake a sound test, and in the process of doing that, we aggravated the dogs as much as possible that were outside to try and get the highest level of noise so that we could measure that. And, um, you know, I fair to say we had hoped it didn't exceed the noise levels, but we have readings that show that it did. And uh, that's not acceptable, and we're willing to address that issue. And I think at this point I'd like to turn it over to Kevin Peterson, who is our acoustical engineer from SAJ <coughs> Acoustics, and he will tell you what he did, what he found, <coughs> and what his recommendations are for going forward to fix this issue. And I believe he'll need to bring the screen down for that. Uh, so, okay, everyone can see on both screens? All right, so um, my name is Kevin Peterson. Um, I am a senior acoustic consultant at SH Acoustics. Uh, we're a, an acoustic consulting firm based out of Milford, Connecticut. Um, to give you a little background on uh, my company, um, it's been around for uh, 20 years, and uh, we've been doing uh, noise control and acoustic design um, all over the uh, United States um, and some international work as well. Um, we've done over a thousand projects. Uh, here's just, just you know, just to give you a, a few um, examples of the kind of work uh, that we do, um, just to show that uh, we are really a world-class uh, consulting firm. We've done uh, work for um, the Las Vegas Raiders uh, new practice facility out in um, Henderson, Nevada. Um, the Statue of Liberty Museum, if you have not been there, I suggest you go, um, plus a, a variety of other museums, um, uh, noise control projects, home theaters, concert venues, uh, recording studios, um, and uh, there's just a picture of, of some of our work. Um, Robin asked me to, sh to share this with you just to show that um, we are uh, really a, a world-class firm. Um, some of you have, uh, have my, uh, our company's brochure. Um, to give you a little background on myself personally, um, I joined SH Acoustics a little bit uh, uh, almost a year ago. Um, prior to that, I worked at a different uh, consulting firm uh, called Walter Stark Design Group out of the Hudson Valley. Um, there I was a project engineer and served as chief consulting officer um, as well towards the end of my time there. Um, I've done work uh, in um, Brazil, Guatemala, um, Abu Dhabi, Hawaii, all over the continental United States. Um, and, uh, and I've had a, a pretty successful career uh, so far. So that's a little bit of, of, uh, of my background. And um, let's move back to uh, Weatherfield. Oh, and, and these are uh, some of the companies that I've, that I've worked for, that I've done uh, studios, noise control, um, um, uh, and any, any sort of acoustic consulting um, for those companies. And uh, Wagtime Play and Stay will make it onto this uh, chart as well, right between uh, Google and YouTube. Um, so I think uh, Robin gave a, a pretty good 
uh, explanation of the um, uh, of the of the background of the project so far. So maybe I will skip that and move on to what my measurements. Um, or let's let's uh, take a step back and look at the noise code uh, because it's um, uh, general business zoned. Um, as you can see from the noise code, the maximum allowable level during daytime hours is 55 decibels um, on an A-weighted scale, um, otherwise known as uh, DBA. Um, you can see the daytime hours um, beneath that. Um, the uh, zones that we're most concerned about is the residential zones, um, which is, uh, which is that's uh, what's, what's circled up there, is 55 decibels. And there's some more. Uh, qualifying statements on background noise. Um, we're not going to run into this too much uh, because um, our solution to fix this, uh, uh, the noise issue, um, won't rely on background noise. Um, so we took three measurements on site. We set up a microphone um, a little bit away from the dogs and uh, measured for about uh, two hours and uh, under three uh, different specific conditions. The first was background noise to give us an idea of how accurate the measurement would be. We measured background noise from, uh, you know, air traffic, um, uh, normal car traffic, uh, birds, bugs, uh, wind, all that kind of stuff to understand what the normal um, ambient noise in uh, that area of Weathersfield uh, was like. So that was the background noise. During that measurement, um, we took all of the dogs and we put them inside. Um, and, and we did that for about half an hour and just let the microphones record um, their levels. Uh, the second time, uh, or the second uh, condition was uh, what I call typical. Um, that's when we just let the dogs out. I did not provoke the dogs in any way. They were just running around being, being dogs, um, uh, as, as you would find in a normal, um, you know, a kind of normal operation uh, mode. Um, and then the last one uh, we're calling excited dogs, and that's when um, I actually went around to the back and uh, all of the dogs saw me and uh, because it was something they weren't used to, ran up to me, um, ran up to the fence and started barking. And that's when quite a few dogs uh, got together and were barking simultaneously. Uh, the reason we did this was we wanted to understand what is the worst case scenario. And um, both of the cousins have asked me uh, to not just um, not down to within the noise code, but, but to um, really fix the issue um, uh, of, of annoyance. Um, and so the, uh, the noise code was, was not really their motivation from, from the beginning. That was from uh, the first time they called me, um, was that to actually, to actually solve the issue here. Um, so you can see up in the... When did they call you? First time. So, so I, I don't really want to get into. We, we can get into that conversation um, later. Later on, why don't okay. you just finish your presentation? Thank okay. you. All right, um, and you can see in the, up in the uh, the corner. That's uh, my my setup um, uh, near the railroad tracks between the residential properties and uh, Wagtown Plain Day. Um, here's a just a site plan. Um, the time that I took the measurements. Um, and the date was September 24th, 2019. So this is the, um, the levels that we measured. Um, I included an average level to give you an idea of, of uh, what is typical, and then a max level throughout the entire measurement. Um, so obviously, uh, for the background condition, there were um, no dogs, so there was not a maximum level from the dogs. Uh, but the maximum level that just the ambient noise of, of Weathersfield met was uh, 69.9 decibels, um, and the average level was about 56.2. Um, again, this is uh, this was more so that we could understand the accuracy of our measurement. Um, this doesn't play as big of a role um, uh, once we once we uh, get towards the uh, solution. Uh, so the typical measurement, which is when uh, the dogs were uh, wandering around in the back. Um, without being uh, provoked in any way. Um, the average level was 57.1, um, which is uh, just about a decibel above um, the normal background noise. Um, the maximum level that they reached throughout that measurement 
was uh, 68.5 decibels. So uh, clearly something that was over the background noise um, that you could, uh, that you could, oh, sorry. Um, that 68.5 was, was from um, uh, a gust of wind. The max level from the dogs was 66.7. So that's, um, that's the uh, difference between the max level column and the max level from dogs. Um, and then with the excited dogs, that's with me going around back and uh, sort of provoking them. Um, the average level was 68, so obviously quite a bit uh, elevated. Um, the maximum level that it got um, for one second throughout this measurement, it hit 71.9 decibels and um, the max level uh, from the dogs, and, and that that, uh, that one second was from from, from dog barks, um, not not a gust of wind or anything else. So um, that became our goal, 71.9. Uh, we approached it as what can we get 71.9 decibels um, down to an acceptable level. Um, so I uh, recommended in my report um, that I, I believe you have um, that uh, an eight foot wall uh, will reduce this. Um, noise by uh, 17 decibels. What I recommended um, was either uh, a three-quarter inch layer of plywood or cedar planks. Um, and uh, this would take the that maximum level, I just rounded it up, but, but that's 72 decibels. That was the worst case scenario that we measured throughout, um, throughout the, the day um, with the provoked dogs. Um, that would reduce it down to the 55 decibels. Um, uh, so within the noise code. Um, beyond that, um, the maximum level uh, under typical conditions, uh, which again was, was the maximum level throughout the entire time we were measuring, uh, in that particular condition we were measuring for about 45 minutes, um, that we hit uh, with, with an eight foot wall in place, uh, that would reduce it down to 50 decibels. Um, beyond that, so that's again the maximum level uh, throughout a typical, the, the typical condition uh, would be um, only hitting 50 decibels, which is uh, which is obviously 5 dB below the um, the noise code. So during uh, normal operation, this is that's going to happen. Uh, you know, once every once in a while, it's going to get up to 50. Um, but I would expect, in my professional opinion, that the uh, noise code with this uh, eight foot wall um, with a with the one inch cedar planks or the three quarter ply. Um, the noise code would would rarely uh, uh, ever be exceeded. Um, it would take um, it would take uh, quite a bit of dogs barking simultaneously um, to hit that. Once I submitted my report, um, I got a question from the cousins, and they said, "What can I do to make this even better? To really just um, uh, you know, not just not just do the um, uh, not just hit the the 55 decibels in the worst case scenario." Um, but do even better than that. And so I went back to my calculations and um, found that adding, and they, they asked uh, if they added, made the wall thicker, and they made it another two feet higher. Um, and that is uh, what I found was that, that uh, you know, uh, following those instructions that we'd get an, an additional uh, two decibels, or sorry, three decibels of, uh, of reduction which would reduce the worst case pro provoked scenario down to um, 52 decibels and um, uh, the maximum typical condition down to 47. So um, that, uh, uh, that sort of concludes my, um, my findings, uh, my recommendations. This, this slide? Okay, Can yes. Uh, yes, so um, uh, you can see the, uh, the highlighted area um, that the, the pen, the, the play area uh, exists right now, um, the Wag Time Play and State Building, and uh, I think you can, it's kind of hard to see on my screen. Um, can everyone make out kind of where that, that arrow is pointing? I'm not Kind of hard for me to see <coughs> in this. It's on the railroad. In this angle, yeah. it's uh, yeah, it's right by the railroad tracks, um, and uh, and there is um, uh, a dashed line showing where that where those property lines are. 
um, distances were taken into into account when we did this um, this model, uh, the noise model. Uh, if any commission members yeah. have questions, this might be a good time. Just back up here. Questions, Tom? Um, I see that your report and your presentation listed or cited uh, decibel levels. Was there any readings or any consideration given yeah. to issues? Excuse me. Um, <coughs> The microphone. Yeah. All right, sorry about that. Um, I noticed that, that, the, that your report and your presentation dealt uh, solely with decibel levels. Um, it, it seems to me that, that uh, there may be problems that, that some people have with uh, levels of, of pitch or frequency of, of the sounds. And um, did um, you give any consideration or any analysis relating to uh, tho that kind of issue? The, the, the you know, different dogs uh, bark or yelp at, at different frequencies, and some are more uh, disturbing than, than others, whatever the, you know, the, the, the power of the sound, the decibel level. Of course, of that's, the, a, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, so the, uh, the DBA, um, that A at the end of the decibels um, actually represents a frequency weighting. Um, uh, that's, that's what humans are sensitive to um, at around uh, 40 to 50 decibels. Um, so basically uh, what that means, well, to answer your question, yes, I did consider frequencies. Um, even though there are single, um, single number decibel levels uh, throughout the model, I actually calculated at every single octave band um, within the range of human hearing. Um, so uh, without trying to, to overcomplicate this, um, I did a, a separate calculation for each octave, inc including the very lows and the very highs um, and everything in between. And uh, from that, put the barrier in, 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 the, in my, uh, my computer model. Uh, put the, the sound barrier in and calculated every single decibel, you know, how much at 63 hertz, how much is this, this barrier going to reduce it? At uh, 125 hertz, how much is the barrier going to reduce it? Um, and at the end, there is a, uh, an A weighting, um, which, is a, which is an American standard, um, to help correlate uh, all those different frequencies into a single number um, that we can hear. So that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a little complicated, but the, um, the noise code um, specifies that, that, a D, that an A weighting scale should be used. Um, and so, so that's what I used at the end of the calculations. So really, uh, my projected numbers of uh, you know, what you see here, um, that is maybe 20 or so calculations that is distilled down to, down to a single number. Uh, but but frequency is is taken into account. Yes, and based upon those findings, do you 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 feel confident that the barrier that you've uh, you know presented as as proposed uh, will uh, basically reduce you know those those levels, particularly mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, I would think you know the most uh, disturbing sounds are going to be at the higher frequencies. Yes. Yeah. And and uh, and fortunately for us, uh, fortunately for everyone, really, um, the higher frequencies are more easily attenuated um, by that barrier. And your barrier is is a you know basically uh, a solid barrier of, of wood. Is there are, are there any, is there any treatment to the wood uh, that uh, promotes uh, sound sound absorption? Because it does seem as though you know the Sound waves may hit it, but they may reverberate back, uh, based upon the kind of materials that you've selected. Um, there is uh, so the the, uh, the point of the barrier is really just to block noise, um, and uh, wood barrier similar to uh, like what you see on the side of highways um, is going to do a sufficient job. And and I, I should add that a 17 or a 20 decibel reduction in noise is is not just noticeable but significant. 
it's a, it is a, a very, very significant reduction. Um, is there any treatment of the wood? Is it, is it no, there's no treated treatment. wood or paint or anything of that sort? Uh, no. What about uh, the useful life of, the, of this, you know, this barrier structure? Do you have an estimated useful life uh, calculation? Uh, I don't. I may need to consult the engineer for that. It's actually sort of a question that I had was not necessarily the useful life, but the construction methods. So when you're doing a noise wall, like a noise barrier on a long highway, you have the construction methods laid out. Are you specifying the material only, or are you specifying how to ensure the enclosure has no gaps? Yeah, I, I've spoken with the uh, with the engineer on on how um, to make those, and and the answer uh, with building that is is by using um, a, a non hardening coffin between the the board layers, uh, so that that gaps don't form over time. And with regard to the question about sustainability of the materials, I think as with anything, maintenance is important, and the applicant will definitely have to replace any deteriorated uh, portions of the wall should it happen. Being wood at some point, I would expect they would need to do that perhaps even in its entirety, uh, but that should you approve this application, it goes without saying you could put that condition on there, but even without that condition, they'd be obligated to do it, so. Rich? Um, I was, oh, yes. I'm sorry, excuse me. No, keep no go ahead, keep on. No. <laughs> you may save me having to say anything. <laughs> I may, probably not. Um, with regards to, to uh, maintenance of, of this, are there any uh, recommended uh, maintenance requirements for the owner with regards to this, this structure? You know, in terms of uh, uh, you know, annual inspections, uh, you know, treatment of, of the materials, uh, you know, uh, prevention of things like insect infestation, particularly termites, that sort of thing for the supporting structures uh, for the wall. We have contacted a fence company, a Hartford Fence Company, to put the fence in. We actually have a date to do it should this application be approved. It will be something that the building department is going to look at and the building inspector will um, uh, authorize it. Um, because of the height, it, having increased the height, um, it's a fairly significant um, you know, support structure because of wind load and that will all be worked out with the building department. There, it, it's a wood fence. I mean, it has to be kept up should it deteriorate, they'll have to replace it or replace those portions. I think even on the fence barriers that the state puts up, you can see at times that there are new boards that are put in because old boards have, have come out. So I, that's a given, they would have to do that. But we are not aware of anything that is unusual with regard to this wood fence. And it's going to be quite thick. I guess that your answer sort of addresses one of the things I had, which is, are you proposing an eight foot high fence or a 10 foot high fence? Because you said the fence is higher, but all the plans we see and the detail are for an eight foot high fence. We are proposing a 10 foot fence and okay. we've talked to the engineer about it and uh, he just, we didn't submit a new plan that shows it, but that's, if the application's approved, we'll give you a plan that shows that it's going to be 10 feet. And I've talked with uh, Peter Gillespie about this, and uh, it was through those discussions that we realized, given the height at 10 feet, certainly we'd need to have discussions with the uh, building department to approve the construction. Right. I guess my, my other question is that the fence, that I assume the location is gonna stay the same with the height increased, there's, there's fence on the north and the east, but there's nothing on the south. And 
if you're at 72 decibels with aggravated dogs on the railroad tracks, I can't see how you couldn't be over the business zone limit receptor at the property line that's six inches away from the chain link fence on the south side. And I guess my concern is, you know, you, you're addressing the neighbor, the, the residential concern a quarter mile away, but you have the same concern two feet away. You know, the, the people next door, I guess that's like a dog washing place and an electrician, but just beyond that is a funeral home. So I don't know what the sound levels will be there and whether it'll be problematic for them and whether, you know, putting a fence around more of the play area would address that or not. Um, you know, I don't, I do appreciate that you're dealing with the, the complaints that have been made. It's just I don't want to have you go through all that time and effort and then be non-compliant on the third side out of the box. My acoustical engineer is confirming that probably we would be non-compliant on that side. So yeah, I'm not a scientist, but I, <laughs> I would assume so. Um, we have discussed this. Uh, you know, we've discussed, well, what if we still need to do more? Would it make sense to fence that side in also? There are, we're not aware of any complaints that people have had from noise going out that way. Um, these were conversations that we had last week, uh, late this week, so they're fairly recent. We would be willing to do additional fencing on through that area. It's a little more difficult because we were looking at whether or not there were easements that we had to deal with and the ability for CLNP to get their truck into the fenced area to take care of some wires, I gather, that may be in the back there. So there are a few logistical issues, but if it is feasible to do, I'm looking at my clients to see if they agree. I'm getting shaking of the head yes, <laughs> that we would be able to do something more there also. Yeah, I mean, I, and, and I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm, uh, I'm just you're not kind of difficult. observing that you're, you're dealing with part of the problem, but not all of the problem. And I, I would think that you know, at least you'd want to consider whether you were going to deal with all of the problem <laughs> rather than you know, just basically guarantee that, you know, if if somebody else buys this building next door that has sensitivity, that, they're that, not gonna that you're out of the, you know, that you're in so the soup. I don't have a plan before you that shows that. I can put on the record a commitment that we would work with the planning department and the uh, engineering department and um, CLNP to find as reasonable a solution to that. It may not be the whole area. It could be, didn't you indicate that even doing two more um, coming down, two more panels panels would be helpful on that side? On, on the fentanyl? No, right here. Uh, yes. Yeah. So even a, an additional, uh, some additional level, if we can't close it off completely because of CLNP access, um, we would certainly be willing to add, you know, as much as we can to the point that CLMP says this is not going to work for us. Rich, I think there is a, a white vinyl fence, <coughs> excuse me, that encloses their yard there now. Mm -hmm. A solid yeah. vinyl fence. Oh, am I got the wrong direction? So, assuming we're talking about the yeah. that side. The side toward South side. South like South Orsini's South. electric. Yeah, yeah, that entire backyard, if I'm not mistaken, is already... Um, enclosed in at least a six foot high fence. It might be taller than that if I, I'm just trying to recall now, but. Well, whose fence? It's on the other property, MAO electric property. Yeah, I mean, and they're showing, the, I guess they're showing the chain link on, on, their on the enclosure on their side. Right. There's, yeah, it's kind of busy over here. Yes. So, um, assuming you, you don't, 17 decibels is pretty significant, um, darn significant. Um, 
want to take a moment and describe for the layman what a decibel difference is? Uh, <laughs> sure. So a, um, well, a one decibels are, uh, are a bit tricky, especially when we start talking, well, when you, when you try to uh, assign um, sound a number, it can get tr pretty, pretty tricky. Um, as a general rule, um, a 10 decibel increase is considered, uh, like to, to the human, is roughly a doubling of volume. Um, so a one decibel increase is uh, hardly uh, noticeable. Three decibels is noticeable. Six is pretty significant, and then and then ten would be um, would be uh, double. I mean, of course, that's a little subjective, but right. um, that's just a rule of thumb. Um, so you're having and having again. Yes. <coughs> you're getting seventeen decibels, right? Twenty with the ten. Yeah. Twenty with, with the, the with the with, with the, the ten foot fence. Yeah. Um, so how far from the chain link fence was your receptor in the test? Um, that was, um, I don't know if I have an exact, oh no, I do have an exact level. Ish, ish is fine, because I'm, where I'm heading is, how far is the nearest, res, you know, uh, residential property? Well, if you, so if you look right here, um, the residential property line, um, I'm not sure how, how well it's showing up on the screen there, but there is a, um, there is a, a resident, it's a red dashed line um, that shows where it goes from the, the railroad tracks Behind into the, the residential yeah. property. So even though there's not a house, uh, the closest part to uh, um, the Wagtime Plain State property is, uh, is heavily wooded. Um, uh, that's the house off of Lincoln Street, but um, Lincoln Road, Lincoln Road 33, 33, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, but that, uh, despite the fact that, uh, that there's nothing there, that the noise code needs to be met at that property line, whether or not um, true, there's, a, there's a house or, or uh, you know. So, the zoning, right. so, so where I'm ultimately heading is, um, could you describe, <clears throat> so I know just enough to be, um, well, to be wrong, okay? <laughs> um, I've designed noise barriers on the highway. You know, as a line, mm -hmm. and I, I recognize, and we can all have a personal experience, that the best place that a noise barrier works is right behind it. Yes. That the farther you get from it, the less effect it has. So, so 17 decibels is in fact very significant, and and people should be thrilled with that, right? But there's also the distance, and then it becomes background noise, right? Uh, you know, quarter mile, f a quarter mile, mm -hmm. or I don't know how far, but at some point or other, it's just background noise. Yes. And. I, I guess I'm trying to, you know, rationalize in my head, at what point does this noise of a, of a, a dog that's barking just become part of the background? Because what the numbers that you just saw were that, you know, as he puts his wall in and it drops down to 50, it's below the ambient noise. It's mm -hmm. below what you're hearing every day if the, if the place wasn't even there. That's what yeah. you're suggesting, which isn't possible, honestly, right? Right. So, so it's not completely accurate. So I'm just trying to get you to, well, uh, unless you would say I'm wrong. I'm, I'm uh, well, okay, there's, there's kind of two parts to that. First, the, uh, um, the further you move back, the less effective the barrier becomes, um, which is true, but um, the more distance attenuation you get. Correct. So it's, a, it's, a, it's um, kind of a trade-off um, if... Uh, um, all of the, all of those distances were taken into account um, when I did my computer model. Um, the the distances from um, uh, from the wag time, you know, where the furthest a dog could be away from the barrier, um, because you know if you got a barrier, you want if you got a dog and a person, um, that's going to be the most effective. The further you get away, um, the more easily sound can can kind of come over top of that barrier. Uh, which is what you were describing, um, but then again, because you're further away from the dog, it's quieter because of the distance. distance right. um, so both of those factors were were accounted for um, in the in the calculation, um, and we were discussing this earlier this week. And although it's not in my report, um, near the houses, the um, with this um, decibel. Um, or sorry, with this barrier, with a 20 decibel decrease, we're going to be a, a dog barking would be near 35 decibels 
in the, or sorry, near 37 decibels, I think it was, um, uh, near the actual houses. Um, the background noise um, is going to fluctuate. It's going to go up and down, um, uh, you know, with, with traffic, with um, the seasons changing. Um, you know, bugs are going to go away in the winter, but um, it's going to significantly reduce that. The human ear is typically capable of hearing, you know, under, you know being able to pick something out uh, 10 decibels below the, the background noise. Um, so if, if someone, if I were to take a measurement right here with a, with a microphone and someone's uh, phone were to start vibrating, I may not see a change in the, in the actual measurement, but I may be able to hear the phone vibrating on the other side of the room because that, you know, maybe this is 50 decibels here, but it, and the phone is, is going, going off at, uh, let's say 42. Right. Uh, I may be able to hear it, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean that, um, that it's going to be, um, so, so would it be fair to say that? <coughs> After the wall goes up and you're in the residential neighborhoods behind, the peaks are gone, mm -hmm. and you'll still, if you listen for it and are paying attention, will hear the dogs barking. You would have to really listen for it, yeah. Right? But the um, background noise is there. Yeah, know, it's, it's, it's going to be... Um, and you should be taking the peaks off. Yeah, so if, if you look, it, the, the background noise was... Um, let's go to this, this slide. Uh, typical background noise was 56. Um, with the excited dogs, um, you know, that's, that's uh, depending on the absolute maximum or an average level of when they were all barking. And over time, um, we hit uh, uh, about 68 and a half, 69 decibels. Um, that's a pretty significant level over the ambient level. Um, uh, 56 to all the way up to, to 69 or, or 72. Um, so taking 20 decibels off of that uh, is going to be a, a significant, significant improvement. Thank you. Thank you. Tom? Um, I had a couple of questions I, I was yet to be processed like uh, when I was uh, querying you before. Mm -hmm. um, the engineer has um, given his report uh, and his concern is relating to uh, runoff and uh, possible uh, effects upon the wetlands area and among the things that his recommendations include is uh, that the fence that the bottom of the fence uh, be no more than you know X amount of inches away from the ground level so mm -hmm. that there's clearance for water to flow uh, underneath and that means that there's going to be a gap down below, yes. because I'm, I presume I'm going to presume that the commission is going to incorporate the recommendations of the engineers' report into any conditions it attaches, mm -hmm. uh, assuming it also votes to approve it. Um, now, what's going to be the effect of you know that gap right at the bottom upon your calculations for noise attenuation? Um, having a gap at the bottom is uh, is going to have an insignificant effect on on um, the attenuation. Reason being is that any any noise that is going along the ground, uh, the the ground itself, whether it's um, as long as it's not like concrete or water, um, even if it's frozen dirt or uh, you know leaves, um, the ground has a significant attenuation. Everything that's not going directly into the ground. Um, is is more what what we're concerned about. That's what's going to travel the furthest and and cause the most disruption. And the next question I have doesn't really relate to your attenuation efforts, but uh, to the operation of the facility itself. Uh, what are the hours of operation that the uh, uh, you know that that this outdoor play area for the dogs? Uh, would be on a daily basis. I may need to refer to you on that. Uh, hours of operations of the. Uh, the uh, daycare hours are from. 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. for daycare on Saturday and on Monday through Friday. Uh, they open at 6 a.m. 
and to stay open till 7 p.m. on Monday through Friday for daycare. Daycare closes at 7 p.m., but they don't let the dogs out until, um, I've been told it's like 10 of uh, 8, 7.50 to 8 o'clock, they'll let dogs out into the play area, so it's eight, around 8 in the morning. And, and I'm going to I'm going to ask or expand your question to just all the operating characteristics if you're on this topic. Uh, so what what time they must let them out in the afternoon as well? Is it all day long starting at 7:50? That dogs are out there? Yeah. Yes. I okay. mean, what I said before is definitely true. That the dog play area is a really important feature of the build, of the business. Okay. And if the dogs had to stay inside. It would be a very different kind of operation. I'm not even sure they could stay in business if all they could do was to have dogs inside. So, so there are always dogs so out there playing. There are always dogs outside. Yeah. And now the protocols. The early morning hours. Right. Right. Yes, yeah. and and not after seven. Um, if there is a border, for instance, if if uh, there's a dog boarding, you know they might take the dog out to after seven um, to do what the dog has to do and then bring it back in, but. Most dogs are gone from 5 to 5.30. They get picked up by the owners, and everybody has to have their daycare dogs out of there by 7 o'clock. So how many dogs are we dealing with when it's full the, and operational? The average, oh, dear, I think I wrote this down. I think you told me the average was around 50 to 60. I'm going to, uh, you want to tell me what it is? The average number of dogs. Num that number of dogs when it's fully operational. Um yeah, so if you, you need to come up, to be, Brian, you'll have to come up and identify yourself for the record. <coughs> Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Brian Cousins, and I'm one of the, the owners. <coughs> um, your question was how many dogs are outside. There's never more than 40 dogs outside at one time. Um, we could have as many as 62, 65, um, but not all the dogs are able to be together, um, either size, aggression, wh what have you. So there are times that there's dogs inside. There are three indoor playrooms, and the dogs will be separated based on um, energy level, um, that sort of thing. So as far as being outside, there would never be 65. We, it, wouldn't, it just wouldn't be feasible. What do, what do you do during inclement weather? They're separated between the three indoor playrooms, and they still are let outside to use the bathroom. Um, they're encouraged to use the outside, not obviously to go inside. It's yep. just a lot more maintenance for the staff if they do. Um, it happens, but it's certainly not. Um, it's certainly not encouraged. So um, they're let outside in in smaller groups, um, and obviously for shorter periods of time. Yesterday and this morning, they most of them didn't even want to go outside. Um, we kind of forced them to go outside, but when it's inclement weather like that, we also have a smaller load. I think yesterday we had 40 dogs total for the day. So even if every single dog was outside, there only would have been 40. But okay. you know, when it's 12 degrees or pouring rain, and then you also have dogs that are, the, uh, the winter dogs that actually like the cold and the snow, they'll be outside during the snow, and then you have other dogs that won't go outside probably for the whole day. They'll just go out to relieve themselves, and then they're back inside. So we do have indoor playrooms, but it's, it's more confining, and we find that when they're outside, they're more in their element, and surprisingly enough, they're actually better behaved. Are there other operational questions? Yeah, one over here. So generally speaking, on an overall basis, are there fewer dogs outside or not outside as much in the winter season as compared to the summer season? I would say yes. Um, it's a difficult question. Um, one of the things in Robin's um, protocol presentation was we plan for 60 dogs a day because we have no way of knowing. We don't require reservations. So tomorrow there could be 64 dogs, and on Monday there could be 20 dogs. Um, holidays um, you know, are a huge factor in there. Obviously the weather. Um, we have a lot of teachers, so when there's no school, that whole group usually doesn't bring their dog. Um, so. <coughs> it's 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 a we plan for about 60 and it, it, we don't really plan it based on weather and it's, it's kind of hard to do and especially when we don't know if you know it's going to be cold all day this <coughs> this was a fluke here where we had you know 15 degree weather in the last couple of days so 
the dogs that came in the morning, most of them did not want to go outside. So mm -hmm. we, we kind of cater every day. We have a protocol and a procedure plan, but we cater every day to the day. And how about in the winter when it gets dark at 4.30, are they going out in the dark? They're still outside. I mean, the, the outside is lit, and it's the, the entire area isn't fenced off. It's about, um, it's about three quarters of the actual back area is actually fenced off. And it's, it is attached to the building, so we can open the back door and let them out from the inside. So there's no, um, th there's no risk of getting a dog loose or anything like that. Thank you. George? Um, what happens if your plan doesn't work? Do we want to put, and I'm thinking, and I'm not even sure we can, but uh, do we want to put a time limit on this, or are you going to, how are you going to treat that kind of situation? That's a good question. Why um, we wouldn't have an issue with coming back and doing a follow-up study for you to show that the decibel level's been reduced. And maybe do some remedial work to. If it's needed, yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I guess along those lines, if I could ask, if if we were to do something like that and conclude that we needed some additional work from from the noise expert perspective, you know, are you still able? to do additional things at that point? Would, it, would you have to take down the fence and put a whole different one up? Or can you put you know, a liner on the inside of the fence or other types of things to increase the effect? Well, I'm going to turn that over to, to uh, you to answer. But I would also just say you know, the additional baffling or fencing that we had <coughs> talked about, m perhaps it would be helpful to include later if, if it appeared that it was needed, but um, is there anything else that one can do in, on, in addition to a 10-foot high wall, should it prove necessary? I believe you, you sound like you know what you're doing and that you're, you're quite confident that this is going to work. But I, I am confident that this is going to work, but in the event uh, that it didn't work, um, I'd simply come back on site and figure out why it's not working. Um, this is something that I've, uh, you know, a wall like this uh, and a calculation method that I've, um, that I've used, has been used many times before, not just by, I didn't invent it, um, but I've used it successfully before. Um, it is a, um, uh, an, uh, it's, it's, it's a standard um, calculation method. Uh, if it were not to work for some reason, um, the, the procedure would be to get on site, figure out why it's not working, um, and there's almost always an issue. There's almost always a uh, a solution. There, there's there's something that we can do to fix it. If it's uh, gaps in the wall for some reason, um, it'd be a matter of plugging those. If it if I felt that the too much sound was making it directly through the barrier, then um, then we it'd be a matter of adding a lining or maybe another layer of wood or or whatever that would be. Well, while you're up, um, are you proposing? doing the fence with no gaps and overlapping as you discussed in your report as being a good way to do it? Uh, yes, with just with the exception of the, the hole at the bottom. And um, is there any difference in the mitigation benefits of the cedar as a material versus the plywood material? Uh, nope, there's no benefits. Uh, the the Name of the game is really just uh, mass, and uh, and if you look at the weights of one inch cedar versus uh, three quarter inch plywood, uh, that's where they kind of uh, equal each other. So, um, uh, so yes, that's uh, there's not really a, a difference between. And you're proposing that the thickness is increased to two inches. Is that? And we're oh right yes we're we're doing uh, uh, two by twelves. So um, it's even thicker than than either of those recommendations. So it's going to be more than more, you know, the, the, the noise going through the barrier, which is always going to be some, it's going to be more effective with the, the thicker uh, 2 by 12. I suspect the commissioner's question was, the first question was more along the lines of, if you come back, if we ask you to come back afterwards, is there opportunity without telling you, well, it didn't work, got to close down. You know, they're looking for that next step that's possible, right? Yes, that kind of yes, and, and I, th there's, there's always a, a way to make it better, yes. Tom? Um, the, the issue of, you know, what next kind of uh, reminds me of something that occurred to me as I was 
reading the report in preparation for the uh, meeting tonight. And that is that I didn't see in the report uh, that there is uh, a, a schedule or an intent or a, a determination to uh, do a, a post-completion evaluation. And uh, you know, that may be something that uh, the commission may consider as a requirement for the, the permit. And I was wondering if, you know, how the owner would respire, would, would uh, 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 how, the, how much that would appeal to the owner uh, if that was, you know, a condition that the commission uh, imposed. Because it does, you know, it's, 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 you know, the plan may seem good on paper, but how it actually carries out in the field can be, a, you know, a different matter entirely. And, and frequently in, ex in, in the execution of any plan, one of the chief things that is frequently left out that uh, planners uh, really aspire to is, is an evaluation section. Uh, so um, if I can have some feedback relating to, to that issue. And the second issue that I've got is more of, of an environmental issue, and that is uh, the uh, dealing with the, the waste materials, the waste products of, of the dogs, and how that's dealt with since this is going to be an outside area. And I suspect that uh, there will be you know, considerable defecation and other kinds of uh, you know, pollution-relating matters that could affect uh, runoff from the property. and. Uh, pollution levels into streams and even though I'm sure that inland wetlands would have something to say on that I'd also appreciate some uh, you know some statements with regards to the owners practices relating to uh, the the taking care of uh, uh, of the excrement and the products <coughs> of the dogs so well I can tell you that that is something that they are very rigorous about the state has inspected the facility, and uh, it, that's something that the state looks at, and the state um, has signed off on the operations. Um, that that can be picked up and removed is and is uh, eliminated according to you know, safety procedures that they have in place. It, the area where the dogs are and when they go outside, it is washed down, and that was where this issue came from as to well, what happens with that runoff? Um, we have met with the engineer. Uh, oh, first and foremost, with regard to the state, um, we do comply with all state requirements uh, in terms of the operations that uh, are in place with uh, the governing agencies there. But the town engineer has indicated perhaps this is something that should be looked at a little more closely. And um, we have filed as of today, and it's can you bring that up onto the screen? Can you even? It's on the list that we got. Thank you. So it's those plans were it's up here. brought in um, and delivered to the town engineer and the town planner today. And you have copies of those. They show a, um, a, a swale. Um, that will allow infiltration at the end of, outside of the attenuation, sound attenuation wall, allows infiltration of anything that's running off. Things do slope towards the back. Anything that's running off that parking area that's fenced in where the dogs play. The town engineer today said to um, Jim Cassidy, our engineer, that he would like some additional information. Jim is going out there tomorrow and do um, readings to check grade levels, uh, various grade, and give him some more detail. Uh, he is, has agreed to accept it tomorrow, if we can get all that in, and go to um, the agency, Inland Wetland Agency, for a review with regard to the implications for being in the flood zone. So that's where we are. We expect he, the engineer um, and Jim indicated it was okay to say that it looks good. Looks like it will be a satisfactory resolution of the issue. Um, so, so I'm sorry. No, go ahead. That then means that the plans we received tonight may be subject to some revisions uh, as you finalize the plans with the engineer. The engineer wanted some more detail. 
Jim Cassidy is sending his crew out first thing in the morning to get some more information on existing conditions out there. Okay. Now, I, uh, you mentioned that the proposal uh, uh, or that the, that the facility does have uh, compliance procedures in effect relating to uh, meeting state standards or regulations uh, regarding waste runoff and the, and the like. Would that, could that, could... Uh, I can't could say they're very, uh, you know, there aren't a lot of conditions. Um, so they, the, um, you know, the state bureau that reviews the um, kennel license and the training license want to make sure that waste can be removed. They're looking for the safety of the dogs more than frankly, the environment. Okay. But so they want to make sure the procedures are in place for that. Okay, but in, in, in your discussions or your, your presentation or a response to my question a few minutes ago, you had indicated that the owners have uh, fairly strict and rigorous procedures dealing with uh, the waste and runoff and, and the like. Could those be, uh, or would it be practical to have those procedures also emblazoned upon the uh, uh, the site plan itself or, or presented in written form, but I would, I would prefer if it could be uh, placed upon, even if it's fine print, onto the, the site plan so that uh, that then becomes part of the, the record of any approvals that, that may be uh, achieved by the presentation. The internal removal of waste also, because that's really not an exterior site plan issue, but that can, we can do that. Why don't we give you more than less? <laughs> right. Okay? Thank we you. can do that. So, so George. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going along that line. I think maybe he nailed it. I, I Good. Was in, in the wetland was not done their work. Exactly. Well. So, so yeah. we're going we're gonna to get to that real quickly, if, if you'll allow, because I really want to get to the public before we start yeah. losing their interest, right. okay? Yeah. But, but before we do that, I just want to touch on a couple things, right? So for the file, and so that the public understands the additional stuff that we have. We have a memo from Peter kind of laying out the history. It was referred to earlier and some comments, including like the dumpster location, et cetera, that uh, we'll need to work with. And you heard reference as well that uh, they are in recent uh, receipt of a, of correspondence from our town engineer in which they described uh, a concern about the gap underneath so that water could run out and also you know the contaminants in that in that um, in that water and so they asked them to come up with this settling basin basically at the back of the at the back of the site or at the back of the play area so it catches the water um, that may have contaminants in it and detain it there all right so those are the pretty much the basic things that came out of staff comments then there were uh, certain documents provided to us in favor of and uh, you know, the, the, what I'm going to ask is we've all seen a PDF of a number of um, positives, right? I think they were all positives as I was, as I was going through it. A number of uh, pieces of correspondence that were positive on WAG time and in support of you know, the applicant's um, you know, facility. Um, but last time we were here, we certainly, did we have a a bunch of negatives besides these? It's just that one. Just these? Right. Okay. Yeah. So then there's uh, one from, it's got a bunch of people on it, right? But it's to Peter, and it's specifically from uh, Kieran Williams, who goes through, who goes through a, a number of concerns. And my guess is that many people in the audience have seen it because they're probably on the CC. Things, um, how can PNZ approve it? The application was fraudulent. Um, and they were here a couple of weeks ago, so they addressed it that, at that point. Uh, I'll, I'll just kind of leave it at that. Um, but this is the only piece of paper we have uh, on the other side? Okay. So in re with respect to the town engineer's thing, right, did you have anything more to add? You kind of clarified that you've added the, the, uh, the facility in the back. Uh, in and terms of the list of items that I have here, that we would add a note on the site plan that describes the removal of waste and, and how and it's handled. I don't, I don't know if that's the right place for it, but maybe we're going to be asking. I think that's probably appropriate. We'll be asking you for your waste handling procedures. Okay. Fair enough. I also have an operational protocol 
that is a one-page document that I'd like to leave with you that just talks about the hours of operation, uh, the number of employees, um, and well, I'm not sure there's anything that we haven't already discussed. Very good, But I'd you. like to leave it for the record. I also submitted to Peter already the notices that we sent out, and he has that in the record. Um, I also submitted to Peter, and I'm not sure I put it on the record, uh, resume and brochure of the acoustical company that did the analysis. Uh, he's got all he's of got those it. have been yep. submitted. I can <coughs> leave with you. We have um, 16 copies of all the letters that we've received in support. And Brian, can I ask you if you would take those up and just turn those in? I don't know if you need 16 copies, but for those of you that don't read them on your uh, as a PDF, we've provided those for the record. Right. Thank you. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. and it's the same oh ones yes. we saw. And thank you. And this one's for me. Yes. And I'm and Kevin's also sta handing in a uh, a copy of the PowerPoint presentation that we have given. Thank you for your record, so you have that. And uh, I've talked to you about the engineering response and what we're going to do with regard to floodplain uh, permitting that would be required. And then I have the only other thing. I've already handed in those emails, that email with the planner early on that I referenced, which I do want just to have in the record. And I'd also like to leave with you uh, notes from a meeting with the planner and also copies of the approvals that were filed with the uh, state uh, for the uh, license for the kennel and dog training facility. And I'll, I'll leave those with you. And then other than that, we know there are a lot of neighbors here. We too would be, you know, don't want to keep people out too late. So that's what's going to go next. So you've, uh, you know, you're, you're talking like you've already conceded. What we kind of started to surmise here is that we're not going to resolve this tonight because certain things aren't done. Um, the wetlands, it was news to me that um, the town comments included a, a discussion about a need for wetlands. So we really can't approve tonight anyways. Well, um, actually, it, and you know what? I, I didn't even, I wasn't even aware of that memo until today either. But I do believe the way it was phrased that it's not an inland wetland matter. It's not an issue that comes under the wetland statutes. Instead, it's a floodplain matter. Yeah. So if you that wish gets, to keep it open. Comment, that gets commented on by the town's only board, which is the wetlands group? That is correct. They have jurisdiction over it, but not yeah. as a wetland matter, but as a floodplain matter. I'm just making, there is a slight distinction there. Yep. yep. Um, and yeah, I mean and the distinction is if you're so inclined to approve it, you could do that. If it was a and wetland we application, the statutes do not allow your action until that happens. So uh, keep that in mind. So okay, you could do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess the only thing that clouds it for me is it talks about proposed improvements located within the FEMA 100-year flood limits and in close proximity to wetland areas. I don't know whether he's taking the position that it's in an upland review area or something like that. My understanding is you don't have one. Yeah, I didn't but think so. That's, that's correct. So. Is, uh, uh, fair enough. Uh, I, I think it sounds like you're open if we do decide to keep the hearing open. Um, if, if that is the commission's desire and the fact that we have not a full group here today too, that, that you too. Know, I never like to be in a position where you know, our, we are handicapped by the fact that there aren't you know, the usual number of commissioners here, yep. um, we would certainly be willing to keep it open. There's another issue associated with perhaps um, an alternative as you wrap it around the south side of the property too. That might be something to think about um, if we do extend. So I think you've hit all the issues that the town stuff had. So if you're okay and, and you guys are ready, let's open it up to the public. Thank you. So do we, what do you think? Is, is this worth keeping up for the questions? Uh, we'll, keep it up for the we'll, keep we'll, we'll keep it down then. Let's, let's get started. A couple hands came up here over here. I'm gonna suggest, you know, that 
at will, you can kind of s start walking over here. On the, uh, on the wall. <coughs> so the way. Yeah, if, if you could go to the slide that shows the neighborhood. Oh, okay, sure. That one? This one? <coughs> You're, you're in the you're in the corner. Fair enough. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying to move you back to the microphone so we can get it on the record. <laughs> so, so here I come. Without being annoying. Okay. So my could you Cindy introduce Washerman. yourself? Thank you. Okay. 33 Lincoln Road. Uh, my husband and I have lived in this location for 27 years. We lived there when P.J. Halsey had his veterinary practice there. Never heard a sound. Subsequently, there were other veterinary practices there. Never heard a sound. So now this facility goes in, and I just want to comment when the sound engineer said he did one day for four hours, he put up his microphones. I would say that that is not a very, uh, not a very good data set to explain what it's like living with this sound. On a Saturday, you can go outside to do your yard work, and you can be outside all day long, and you hear dogs. Bark, 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 bark. People who have their dogs there, we also hear staff screaming at your dogs. We hear dogs fighting. We hear staff trying to break up fights. I mean, talk about a noise level. I mean, these are the things that we hear. I can hear these dogs barking in my house, doors and windows shut. I can hear the dogs barking. This is a quiet neighborhood. This was a quiet neighborhood. I don't understand why this was allowed to be put in this location. Um, we, there was a comment made about um, that it's a wooded area, so the sound wouldn't go very far. Well, because the tornado actually went through this area, it's not nearly as wooded as it once was. And in the wintertime, it's going to be an even clearer shot into our neighborhoods, into our homes, hearing these dogs. And I think representations about the hours that they're open and the hours that the dogs are outside were not entirely truthful. I've heard them early in the morning until late at night. And they, don't, they bark for a very long time. And I don't think that it should be required for neighbors to have to adjust their ambient noise level. I, I don't understand why that is considered a tolerable um, option in quiet old, old Wethersfield, Connecticut. I also have concerns about if dog urine and whatever is going down into Breaver Brook. Again, we've lived there 27 years. The, the water table there is crazy. If it's really, really wet, we get ponds in our backyard. Beaver Brook goes from being nothing to a brook. Um, there's all kinds of water stuff going on, and we're the first location. We were the first location off the major MDC sewer line. Everything comes our way. So I really have to think carefully of all the implications of allowing a business like this so close to a residential area. Thank you. Good evening. I'm, I'm Jerry Jingris, 21 Dorchester Road. Um, <clears throat> My wife and I have been residents living on Dorchester Road for uh, 41 years now. And um, it's, it's our community, it's our town. Uh, I also, before retiring, had uh, my own business and I had an office on the South Dean Highway um, and, and ran that business for sev several years. And we're, we're Weathersfield people. We support Weathersfield businesses in town um, as, as best that we can. We buy, we, we get our gas, we, we eat here, and uh, we're just, we're local people. And I, and I applaud the cousins for, for, for attempting to, you know, start up a, a business in town. Uh, and, and, you know, I wish in, in some way to support them. But uh, we have some issues here, and they're serious issues. Um, there was a, a, a discussion uh, Mr. Peterson, I think, did, did a fine job of attempting to address the decibel level um, and assuming that 
that works and the decibel level is brought down and um, you know everyone's happy that the noise ordinance has been complied with we still have a, a very serious issue and that is we have a very separate ordinance the, the, if, if we're just focusing on the, the noise ordinance we're, we're really barking up the wrong ordinance here excuse the pun we there is a separate ordinance on our books 70-3 that refers to nuisance now the nuisance specifically addresses things like barking and and if, if I, I've talked to quite a few people in leadership in this town already who were not familiar with the, the nuisance regulation including um, some police officers that we called to, uh, to, to address the situation. So if, if I may, I'd, I'd just like to kind of just really quickly go through what that 70-3 refers to. Um, <clears throat> it, it's actually section 70, it starts with 70-2, um, defines the term public nuisance to include any animal that barks, whines, howls, or makes any noise natural to its species. So this doesn't have to be out of the ordinary natural to its species in an excessive or continuous fashion as to disturb the peace except where such activity occurs on a farm. Now this is not a farm. Uh, Council for the Cousins referenced that before uh, WAG time to, uh, was set up there was a, uh, another kennel facility that was there but the dogs were kept indoor, it wasn't outdoors. So, um, so again, the exception here is a farm. Regulation 73 states that it should be unlawful to keep any animal on the property located within the town when the keeping of such animal constitutes a public nuisance. There's a, there's a few people in, in leadership again in the town who, who believe that this may not be a public nuisance. It may be just a small handful of people who are annoyed by it. Um, there's, there's quite a few of us that would, would uh, differ with that, and I'll get to that in a second, but let me just kind of finish going through this. 70-5 um, directs the animal control officer as responsible for uh, the administrating the above regulation and provides administrative sanctions and remedies to, to repeat offenders. Weathersfield Regulation 70-5 describes the specific remedies for nuisance violations to include bringing the dogs indoors. There's other remedies, but this is one that I think would, would apply in this particular situation. 70-7 um, describes the penalties for any person who fails to comply with a written citation within seven days to be guilty of, of an infraction and subject to fines of $100 per day for continued violations. Uh, so th that's essentially section 70. And we have, uh, I have a, a petition here that has, this, this particular one here has 29 signatures on it and there's, there's a couple pages that, that, are, that are not here, uh, which I'd like to bring to um, Mr. Gillespie's office tomorrow um, with, with more signatures. We're a total of, of 40 signatures that basically say what's going on at WAG time is a nuisance. The barking of the dogs are constant, and it's when the animal control officer goes out on a on a call for a barking dog. They, they, I don't believe they take out a decibel meter and measure the decibels. What they what they look at and listen to is what's what's going on. How constant is is this barking, and is this the first time offense? Do they warn the people? Is this a second, third, fourth time offense, and so on? It has nothing to do with the decibel level. And that's what we're getting at here. This is not a decibel issue. Um, when I talk to the town manager, it's, it's, you know, again, the references are about decibels, the references about noise ordinance. When we had a police officer come down, um, he went back into his vehicle, pulled out the regulations. He had the, the regulations that reference, news, that reference uh, noise ordinance, but when I specifically referenced section 70, didn't have it in his manual. So there, there's a lot of people here who are in positions of authority who are not familiar with 70-3, and I would, I think we have an issue. So if we solve this issue, and this this uh, application becomes approved because noise ordinances have been met, I think we still have a major issue. We still have a major problem, and I would, we still have a violation of a rule that's on our books. Now, I have we have a petition with 40 signatures across 
from Wag Times as an apartment building with a lot of people in it. None of the signatures that we have come from that apartment. They all come from individual homes that are in that neighborhood. So let that sink in, please. We have 40 signatures from individual homes in a community surrounding this facility. That's a lot of homes. That's a lot of people who are disturbed by this noise. So I, I don't, you know, I'm trying to make a, make a point here that you know, this is, this is not, if, I think if any of you lived in that community, in that, in that immediate vicinity, and heard this kind of going day in and day out, if we heard it for a few hours here and there, it wouldn't be a big deal. But after a while, you, 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 your brain starts to go a little nuts because it's just constant, and you've had enough. And it's like, I didn't want to call the cops, but I call the cops again. Um, you know, because I can't work outside in peace. So it's, it's a significant issue. And, and I think... Uh, I think it really needs to be addressed. So let's see what else I had here. I guess the last thing I'd like to say uh, is until this issue gets resolved, and I do wish the Cousins to have a successful business, but I think there's no solutions to having dogs outside, kept outdoors. I, I don't understand how a, there could be a solution because dogs will bark, and, and we're dog people. We've, we, we've had dogs all our lives, and we have one now, and when this one goes, we're gonna get another one. We, we, we're just, we're dog people. We love dogs, and most of our community are dog people. So I don't think, I don't see how there could be a solution to this by keeping dogs outside. So I would uh, request that the commission uh, deny this application um, that includes any facility that would provide for dogs kept on the outdoors. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a copy of the? Uh, yes, I do. And thank you. I'll, I'll give you this one has 29 signatures, and then I'll bring the remaining ones to Mr. Gillespie tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dave McCormick from 143 Garden Street, <clears throat> and I live at 143 with my wife, Eileen. Uh, last time I was here, I raised my voice a bit, so I apologize for that. Uh, I'll try to keep that controlled this time. We have never once complained that wag time, the noise is too loud. We've always complained that it is a nuisance. So it's been nine months of heavy barking, and let me tell you what my Monday was like. Here we are, nine months in, all these type of issues Resolving this, resolving that, getting the engineers here. So here we are, nine months in, so here's my Monday. So I had the day off from work, my wife was working. I had a sleepless night the night before, so it's perfect. I'll go up and take a little nappy, like around nine o'clock. I go up to my bedroom, lay there for five minutes, bark, 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 bark. It's just like, oh, forget it. So I go outside, do yard work, listen to the barking nonstop. Finally around two o'clock, I'm gonna go sit on the porch, it was a beautiful day. Go sit on the porch to read, bark, 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 bark. So it's, forget it. So I said, I'm going to time it, see how long if they ever take a break. So at 3.30, there had not been a break from the constant barking. My wife got home from work. I told her about it. She goes, well, let's call the police. I called the police. They come out. Of course, they do nothing. They say, well, I hear it. I'm going to get down there. It's really frustrating. The... The sound engineer, great job, but when you live further away, that sound just travels over and just comes right into our houses the same way it's going to over that fence, it doesn't matter. It's gonna come right over into our houses. It's really frustrating. You know, the owner of this, these businesses, all I've heard from Gary Evans is what a good neighbor that he wants to be. He's done nothing to be a good neighbor. In nine months since we've been complaining, nothing has changed. This summer, 5 a.m., the dog started barking. I sent an email off. <clears throat> oh, uh, the owner says that's, those aren't their hours of operation. Some other dog in your neighborhood. The next morning, 5 o'clock, I get up, drive down there. They're wide open. There's people in there working. So I send another email off. Coincidentally, it stopped after that. They do nothing to go out of their way to stop making money to just harass our neighborhood. And you guys have to take responsibility for this. If any of you lived in our houses, it would not have gone on this long. This is unacceptable. We don't give a care about the 
the level of the sound, it's a nuisance. It's a constant barking that is really unacceptable. I really hope you make a decision to shut that down for the fence that was never approved. They never had a site permit to put that fence up and they, shouldn't, they, shouldn't, they should take it down and keep those dogs inside, period. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> oh, sorry, I also have a letter from a neighbor who couldn't be here tonight, so I'll give that to sure. you. Thank you. Evening, everyone. I have been here before, several times before the council, uh, before you gentlemen, and uh, I couldn't forget the fact that you had no knowledge of the specifics of the situation the last time we were here. So at that point, we hold no one blameless here. Blameful, I should say. But uh, I want to confirm what Mrs. Wasserman has said, uh, what Mr. McCormick has said. We have been tormented, you know, more so by the the incompetence, you know, of the town machinery than we have been by the dogs. And that's not a light statement. We've been emailing, we've been petitioning, we've been remonstrating, and, you know, we get these absurd responses that it must be somebody else's dog. It's not somebody else's dog. We have no hostility toward dogs, nor I, as a former businessman, have any hostility toward someone making a living. That's not the issue. When I heard worthy counsel say that, I believe I heard her correctly, that everything was laid on the table by them in February of, was it 2018 counsel or 2019? Counsel, 2018 or 2019? You don't know, okay. Well, it's, it, that's beside the point. They feel they've laid everything on the table with respect to what they should have done, and now we're here discussing this nine months later, eight months later. Everybody wants to fix it now. Well, we're amenable to that, but we don't want to be here nine months from now talking to sound engineers, et cetera. I would suggest, as you ruminate upon the situation, that you take a walk, as I suggested before, over the walk, not walk at Hill Road, Lincoln Road and Dorchester and the lower part of Garden and just listen. It may be too late now as the winter comes on. I don't know whether Mr. Peterson, who I commend this technical presentation, I don't know whether you set up anything over on Dorchester or Lincoln. You should have, okay? Future thought. To the proprietors, the business people, and the council, it would have been nice if you had, in the face of all of these complaints that you well knew were multiplying, to come over to us neighbors who've lived there 20 plus years and say, we got a problem, let's resolve it. Now you come to us, now the town manager comes to us. It's no surprise there's a lot of hostility. And I think it behooves us to solve this situation we want the noise stopped, and we want it resolved, and anything you decide should be conditioned on the stopping of that noise. Go over there and look at the wall, talk with the engineer, listen with your ears, those are the best decimators, and help us all. So they can get their businesses going, and we can have peace of mind. Thank you very much. Do you remind us your name? Yes. Sir, excuse me. Anonymous, so Joe Duffy, 27 Lincoln Road. <laughs> My name is Kieran Williams, 149 Garden Street. Uh, I've lived there, we have lived there, uh, I think like 38 years. I uh, had all the vets before. I'm going to reiterate some of the points that these kind people have listed. Um, the vet house, he was there before, he had boarding because he was a vet and you operate on a dog, and you keep them overnight, perhaps. He tried to get single-run fencing with the planning and zoning and was denied. He was not allowed to have dogs out. Now, several things that I may skip around a little bit, but <clears throat> decibels, even at the fine report that we witnessed, decibels from the start were over the limit. We had police officer after town official tell all oh, decibels are okay. We measured them. Everything is good. You know what? Decibels don't count for crap. It's the nuisance, aggravating, constant, continuous barking, whining, whelping, crying. It's nuisance noise. 
Now, a couple of questions for Mr. Peterson. That land slopes down. You're talking about a 10-foot fence. First of all, you should not, I beg you, this application should not even be considered unless it has all three walls. Not two walls, three walls. If it doesn't have three walls or can't have three walls, this option doesn't exist. We have to do something else. Um, I want to be clear. Is there some rationale for that? Uh, the noise goes out, and we have letters of complaint from the businesses. Noise goes out. You don't think that, oh, I'll put a wall here, and I'll put a wall here, and I'll leave this whole site open, that that's not going to drift into our neighborhood? Okay. That's silly to even contemplate it, in my biased opinion. So how many walls? Only two walls can't even be a consideration. The land slopes. So your 10-foot fence here is how tall? As as opposed to here. So um, I'm not going to have the applicant come up and address each question. Um, we'll jot them okay, down. Okay, well, and make it let me just raise that. Has that been taken into consideration? Okay, because okay, as it slopes, that won't be 10 feet tall, where it might be 10 feet tall at the, at the stop. Um, well, times. I don't, I don't mean to argue, but which way does it slope? It slopes from Beaver, if this is Beaver. It yeah. slopes down to the uh, floodplain or whatever your main concern is and should be because I raised that three months ago. Fecal and urine being washed so, out. So it goes downhill toward being Towards the railroad track. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. I so thought you were I was a, a little taken back that we've got 65 dogs out there peeing and pooping to God's good nature, and we're going to just flush that down. It should not be considered as an option unless that's addressed and fully and properly addressed again. Uh, never more than 40 dogs out there. Man, you got to be kidding me. Do you ever hear about dog pack mentality? What do you think all the noise is? They're barking and fighting and, and you got your girls out there yelling and screaming at them? It's ridiculous. 40 dogs, that's a pack mentality. Doesn't make sense. Lawyer, you said that uh, they would not be successful if they didn't have the outdoor. That's bunk. There are towns that have kennels that the regulation is no dogs outside. You want to build a building in there, three walls and a roof, man, I'm for you. And I want you to be successful. Could you address your comments to us, please? I beg your pardon. I want them to be successful, but not at our expense. Uh, 16 people writing a positive letter about the facility. I'd be happy too if I could if I could afford, or was lazy enough to drop my dog off and pick him up at the end of the day. I'm speaking. You got an issue, sir? Sir, so why wouldn't I be happy? And I write a, a letter. You got 40 homes saying this ain't right. What's a letter saying, I like what they do for me? That's irrelevant. Doesn't hold water. Doesn't make sense. So we talk about 40, never more than 40 dogs out there with a pack dog mentality. What kind of noise do you think that creates? And you know what? The hours that were listed, that's a lie. That's not a fabrication. That's a lie. There's not a day in the week that aren't dogs af out there uh, after 7 o'clock, before 7.50, or 5.30, as we heard, and has been proven to the police. Those hours on are honored that those hours have not ever been honored, and that's a fact. Um, the lawyer says, you know, who are we to determine if happy dogs barking is okay? Come live in our home. You want to live. None of you here live where we live. How would you like to have 40 dogs, up to 40 dogs at a time, out there romping, barking, fighting, people yelling, quiet, bring it up, stop it. You want to live in that? You want to have this? outdoor facility 
four or five houses from where you live? Think about that. It's constant. They don't follow the rules. September 24th, this gentleman's out here taking a reading. In nine months, by not you people, frankly, unfairly, this has landed in your lap because no one else took care of it and the separate silos weren't working and talking and communicating and adjudicating what makes sense. This is a common sense. You know, what, is this gonna make sense? It was denied earlier for a much smaller situation. You can't tell me that they dotted their I's and crossed their T's on the initial, my wording, fraudulent application. Because if it dotted I's and crossed T's, you guys wouldn't be here tonight. And the reason you are here tonight is because you didn't have a plot plan and you didn't have a fence. That was snuck in. That was snuck through. I've asked you before, Peter, who approved this? Did this come to the entire uh, commission, board, whatever is the proper word to, uh, did this come to everybody? Earlier, the council was saying, well, this may not be quite fair. I don't want to say this, but she can correct me, because everyone's not here. I don't follow that reasoning whatsoever. You said five would be good. Did, ev did all of you guys look at this application? Was it adjudicated by the full planning and zoning committee? as I think it should have. So, September 24th, he's doing testing. From March, we have been calling, writing, emailing. And we've been told that this outfit has been doing all kinds of research and looking at this and they're doing that. They stalled, they turned the other way. Oh, this will go away. Maybe this will die down. They understand it was wrong from the outset, my opinion. So nine months. Now I heard you couldn't, they can't guarantee what their suggestion is will work. They should not have been able to have dogs outside for these last six months. The application wasn't approved, excuse me. Application was not approved. It's being reapplied now. We have asked, written, begged, cajoled for a cease and desist order only on that aspect of the business. Never replied. Charles Morrison, you might as well be talking to the, uh, that, uh, that little elf on the shelf. He's the zoning officer who makes these decisions. That's what Peter told us. He doesn't work for Peter, which we thought he did. He works for Gary. He's on the ZBA board. I don't know why he's the official who makes uh, these decisions. Why is it fair that we've paid this price so far and this doesn't work? Will we still keep paying the price? Why not a cease and desist order to stop and to see if this would be effective? I would add, everything we have been told, I'm gonna to say from the town without pointing fingers, all experts, including I think you people, I think, and the town engineer said that the entire back brick wall should have noise absorption material on it that there's a lot of blowback on that brick wall, it comes right on back out. Didn't hear a word about that. Didn't hear a word about a third wall. Don't get it. I really don't get it. Meanwhile, I sure as hell haven't heard a lot of concern about we 40 people, signatories, or whoever else didn't, didn't bother to sign. Um, this office space, Peter, you got this letter. Do you want to read it or do you want me to read it? From Ann Flynn. Which letter are you referring to? I'm sorry. Ann Flynn? <coughs> uh, I'm not sure. The, 
I know which one you're talking about. Is it, was it okay. an email that came in? Um, She's a president and CEO of IQ Telecom on, I think, 78 Beaver Road. She sent that to me and specifically did not want her name attached to it or in the public record. No, th this doesn't say it here. She said it to me. I'm just telling you that's why it's not in the record. Oh, okay. Well, then how do I get that stricken? I was not aware of that. It was not stated. Let's, let's move on. This letter was copied and forwarded to us by you, so there was no mention there of not she, using she her name. She specifically told me that, and that's why it's but, not on the record. Well, I'm apologizing to you and her, but we were not made aware. Okay, you're you're aware of it now. Huh? Okay. Okay. You're a next door business. And I won't give the address, and maybe too late. They have offices, cubicles, windows. We are often disturbed when the so, phone or in so meetings by barking me, dogs. Me. So stop, work, stop reading it. Why? She doesn't. Do I didn't say her name. The beginning. You did it at the beginning. Oh, okay. But that's your fault, no, not all right, mine. All right. Let's let's let's. Don't stop don't it. try to lay that one on me, Peter. You know better. You didn't inform As us. You continue to talk after I told you not to put it in the record. It's my fault. I just want that to be clear here. So nine months, this has dragged on. Application was fraudulent, no fence, no change uh, layout plan. Who did approve this? Is that a question I can pose? Is that a fair question? Who did approve this application? Is, is that fair or proper? Or do I ask in private? No, no, there, there was apparently an earlier discussion with town staff. There was an uh, email that was sent to uh, town staff where they um, suggested they might have a fence in the back. The fence never appeared on their application, therefore it was never approved by this commission, by any town staff. So the play area in the back, as far as the official record goes, was not part of any permit issued by the town. But, but there was a permit issued by the town. Well, they're in for business. In, for, there was a permit issued for a building permit for interior renovations to the building only. No out exterior consent was issued. Which is why we're here again tonight. Correct. There are dog daycare centers, as you indicated, where all of the activity is inside. Um, staff assumed that was the case. So am I wrong to, to guess that if they don't have an application without closing their business that they should not be allowed to continue with that aspect because it wasn't approved initially and it's being refiled today. Why should they be allowed to operate that function of their business in violation of application? I, I don't follow that. Common sense should come into play here somewhere, guys. So, so what are you waiting for? I was just waiting for these guys to stop talking. Oh. Dan thinks it's a pretty funny situation. Um, Jerry Jenger has raised a wonderful, wonderful point. If it's illegal and they're breaking the nuisance laws now, and Lieutenant Mitney and Chief Satran have records of the number of calls and complaints but they don't even have the total number because we were calling from March on and writing and emailing. <coughs> the police didn't even know about it until July. True, told to me by the police. So how many phone calls, letters, emails, complaints were written and lodged yet and resulting in citations and written warnings. There are citations that have been written. There are warnings that have been written. So if it's already against the law, or breaking the nuisance laws, excuse me, why would you approve something that's going to continue to do that? I, I don't understand. That would be a consideration. I would ask you to give uh, serious um, consideration to. So I guess in closing, there, there's a lot more to say, but I can see I've, I've run the gamut with your attention. And um, you owe it to the town residents to give this serious, serious consideration. 
an approval for what we've seen tonight couldn't even be, should not even be an honest consideration. Other matters, other accessories added, absorption materials, et cetera, et cetera. As it stands, this application for the way they want to do it should not be an honest consideration to be fair to the people who have to, who have had and who have to uh, continue putting up with what has transpired. My last request is publicly, we're asking for a cease and desist order on their ability to put dogs outside until this application is approved because they don't have an approved application. How and why should they be able to operate in, in this fashion? That doesn't make sense. We ask that. Whom do we ask? Is it Charles? Okay. So do we have to go to Gary because that's who he wa uh, answers to? I'm asking. I don't know where to take this. No, I, I hear your question. I imagine that is true. Th yes, Char uh, Charles, Charles and Gary? Correct. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for listening. Uh, I hope we can resolve this in a way that they continue to run a profitable business and we can live uh, with them running that profitable business. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Robin Barasa, 248 Dale Road. Um, we, my husband and our daughters have a dog at WAG time. Um, she's a boxer, her name is Harley. Um, and if anyone has had- I saw that letter. <laughs> I did, <laughs> truly her name is Names Harley. Jumps out. Uh, she's our Thank second you. boxer. Um, uh, I'd like to publicly state that uh, myself and everyone that brings their dogs to WAG time are not lazy dog owners. Uh, we walk our dog, uh, we take our dog um, to the local school, we play with her outside, and most of, the, most of the people that bring their dogs to WAG time, if not all of them, love their dogs. They're their fur babies, whether they have children or not. Um, when we heard about WAG time opening up in town, we were thrilled. Um, we had talked about wanting to bring our dog to a dog daycare. There are others um, and local towns. Um, I spent a lot of time, as I did when my children were younger, looking at daycares, because Harley is a part of our family. Um, I spent a lot of time talking to Brian, his staff, the facility, on the phone, um, went there, and um, she's been going there since almost, uh, the beginning of August, and we are extremely happy with it. Um, boxers, like most of the dogs going there, are very active, friendly, rambunctious dogs. They play hard, they do bark once in a while. Um, okay, excuse me. Um, uh, dogs do have, they are pack animals by nature. They like to play in packs. Um, uh, I've been extremely happy with Harley. She goes there, two, three mornings a week. We have friends that uh, have their dogs go there all day. Some go a few days a week, some five days. We've also boarded her there. Um, one of the other things that made us very happy, I am in my mid-50s. I was born and raised in Wethersfield, lived here my whole entire life, sans five years. Um, we are very concerned with the well-being of this town as well. Um, as our own personal family. So to see a business like WAG Time opening up, um, we were pretty excited. Um, it has grown to a successful business. I can certainly empathize and understand with everyone's concerns in the neighborhood. I'm not unfeeling to that, truth, truthfully. Um, but WAG Time has um, offered a service and um, this is just a small fraction of the people who bring their dogs there. Um, there are dozens of other families. Um, some are acquaintances, some are friends of mine, some I just know. And everyone is very, very happy. I think by the success of the business, it shows um, that WAG time has filled a void that was needed in this town. Um, four things that I just want to finish with um, in support of WAG time is that it's a very, it's a thriving, successful business. 
um, clearly. If it wasn't, if the dogs weren't happy, um, I think most of the owners would not be bringing them there. Um, it, it fills this void for dog owners. My husband and I are full-time working um, parents. We have young adults. Um, one lives at home, one is still in college. Um, we do come home, we walk our dog. Um, my husband's able to drop her off. I can pick her up during my work day. It's centrally located. It does, it does help us as far as our work life you know, situation. Um, I think the other thing to think about, um, honestly, is that Weathersfield has been up and down in the economic situation. To have a thriving business, um, one right off the Silestine Highway, which I'll say is part of Silestine Highway, um, is kind of a win-win. Um, it adds to the grand list in this town, which is definitely needed, no doubt. And the other thing that I want to say is uh, WAG Time also um, is a, an employer of kids from the high school and young adults. And that's kind of a really good thing, too. In a time when we're sometimes struggling and kids are struggling to find a job that might fit their needs, um, they can work with animals, some of these kids, and they work happily. So um, I would really like the uh, board to maybe really consider that WAG Time is willing to work to help alleviate these concerns in this situation, and I'd hope that you guys will support them in this endeavor. Thank you. So, question, please. Question? Right here. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. I know. The, the sound comes from okay. all the voices, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you, you mentioned the fact that you did your homework before you brought yep. in. So, so two things. Yep. What, what did you think ahead of time that brought you there, and mm -hmm. what, what do you think it is that is keeping you there? Um, well, one thing, I truthfully, um, convenience. So I work at Weathersfield High School, so I get um, a time in the middle of the day where I can pick her up, get her to home, get a quick bite tea, and go back to work. But what keeps me there and what, what, dro what drove me to really investigate, because I had looked at a couple others, one in Rocky Hill, one in that Newington Berlin line, um, and is that I spent a lot of time speaking with Brian and a lot of time speaking with his staff. And I also, when I go and pick up my dog, I stay and chat for a very long time. Um, if you are a dog owner or a cat owner or any kind of pet owner, normally these animals are part of your family. So for us, Harley is like a child and it was a feeling I had. I would not be keeping her there if she wasn't happy, if she wouldn't run out of the car when we we pull into the parking lot. She drags my arm to the door. If she, if she wasn't happy, we wouldn't. That wouldn't be happening. Okay. Um, so that's the reason why we keep her there. And right. I Thank don't know what else to say. Thank you. Thank you. As as we were doing, as we're. Wait. Excuse me. You had your you had your say. Yes. Jerry Noel, I live on Dorchester Road. I wasn't planning on talking, but there's one, two, three, four, five, six of you with gray hair. And I'm sure your backyards are quiet when you want to go out and sit peace peacefully, read a book. Hmm? We can't do that all the time, and it's very, very annoying. And I know you like bringing your dog there, but if you heard the noise and knew what was going on, you might want to go over there and check it out. And I agree, 40 dogs is a pack. It's a pack. And who knows what's going on? And I'm shaking because I'm talking to you, but <laughs> it's, it's just terrible. And I almost wish you wouldn't be smiling at me and take me seriously, because it's bad. It shouldn't be happening. And I've lived in my house for 41 years and raised my kids, and I have a white standard poodle that I adore, so I love dogs. And I just can't believe this is happening. And I hope you make a good business, but I've lived there longer, and I pay a lot of taxes, as you all do. And it's upsetting. 
I rest my case. Thank, Thank you, you for listening. Thank you for participating. My name is Donna Duffy. I live at 27 Lincoln Road. Um, I hardly even know where to begin with this. Um, first off, I am being woken up in the morning, um, not regularly, but a lot of times on weekends before 7 a.m. with the dogs barking. And um, it's not neighborhood dogs, it's, it's from wag time. Um, it was stated earlier at this meeting that their hours were Saturday from eight to two. Um, then why are we hearing dogs until five o'clock? And then from six to seven a.m. Monday through Fridays. Um, I thought the noise ordinance was seven a.m., not six a.m. Um, I have several questions, but. Um, I'd like to comment about the decibels. The decibels um, are not the issue. It's constant noise, and it's not background noise. I'm concerned about this fence. Um, the decibel numbers appear to be that, to put it in a nutshell, I'm basically going to have to get used to a lower um, decibel noise of dogs barking. I've lived in Weathersfield for 45 years. We've lived at this house for over 20, and it was quiet. This summer, I had to actually leave my home to get some rest from the dogs barking. It was constant, with maybe 10-minute intervals. But there was always a barking, whether it was one dog or whether it was I'm frankly shocked to hear that it could be 65 dogs. So I am asking you to please consider that these are our homes. They are not our businesses, but our homes. And frankly, they're being wrecked. So thank you for listening. Thank you. And I think there were other hands. Hello, my name's um, Carol Hurley. I'm at 76 Black Birch. Um, I've also been a longtime resident. I've lived in Weathersfield for 51 years. Um, and I do understand that um, the neighbors have a concern. And I don't want to just um, dismiss that. But I do feel Wagtime and Brian, um, the cousins, are trying to make an effort and they hired the sound engineer and I feel like even before this is put in place the, the, there's questions about anticipating problems beyond that before we even put up a structure that may help. I have to say I have personally driven over to Dorchester and Lincoln and I've sat there and I'm not s dismissing anything I'm just saying when I've been there I haven't heard anything but I don't sit there all day. Okay. So I, you know, I just want to make it clear that I think everyone here wants a, you know, a resolution that we can all be happy with. Um, you know, but I do appreciate a business in town that is paying taxes. We've got that Connecticut Outfitters or whatever they were across the street from Town Hall that has been sitting vacant for a couple years now at least. So we have a thriving business who is contributing in town. They're members of the Chamber of Comber Commerce. Um, they've always been very um, generous when I um, approach them for donations for whether it be the Mears Charity Ball or something else. Um, they're committed to the community. They live in the community. Brian lives in town. Um, and I consider them friends. And I literally met them through Wagtown, wa Wagtime. And I love it there. And I don't think I'm lazy. I bring my dog there because I don't want her stuck in the house all day when I work, and so I drop her a couple times a week. Um, she loves it there. As far as the um, issues about waste and um, the dog 
pack mentality. I also do go to the Millwoods Dog Park, and there are many dogs there on any given day. And it's not some crazy, wild pack barking and going insane. It's pretty tame, I have to say. And there's a ton of dogs there. And people obviously pick up their dog waste. Obviously not the urine, but I, you know, I didn't really think that was part of the issue here. I thought it was all about the sound. Apparently there's that issue for people. But um, I just want to say, um, you know, really... Uh, they're good people, and, and like Robin Barras had stated, I am very happy. It's convenient. I work in town hall. I literally can just drop her and come straight to work. Um, it, it's, it, it fills the need, and I, have, I know many people who go there, teachers in particular, and they just love it. Um, and once again, I don't want to minimize you know, everybody in that area, their concerns, and I don't think Brian does either, which is why this sound engineer was hired, and I think we need to give that a chance before we jump the gun and say, well, if that doesn't work, but I, I think it's clear that, you know, if it, if it isn't working, that they are willing to come back to the drawing board, and I think that is what is important, um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eileen McCormick. I live at 143 Garden Street. Um, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about our summer. Um, I have two d girls that go to UConn. They were home for the summer and they work evenings and nights. Uh, every single morning they were down in the kitchen. I can't believe it. I can't sleep. Listen to these dogs. This went on all summer. They couldn't wait to go back to school so that they could sleep because of the dogs barking. I'm a school nurse. I work in West Hartford. During the summer, I like to work evenings, nights, I mean, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. When you work those shifts, you have to come home, have a cup of coffee, tea, lay down, and go to sleep for a few more hours. I couldn't do it this summer. I did it twice. I would come home. I could not sleep. You doze off, then the dogs would start all over. People say put on a little background noise. You try that, you doze off, the dogs start. So I couldn't work all summer, my evening, sh my night shift job, because of the dogs barking. So I hope you give this some serious consideration on how it's impacting our neighborhood. Um, and I am, I do have a question for you. Did you, how many dogs were outside when you did your study on September 24th? Were there 40 dogs? Yeah, he'll answer that. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. No, that's, yeah. that's fair. But I'd like we'll to know how many dogs were there. I mean, it's true, to sit out there for two or three hours you're not getting a true picture. This goes on all day. And if there was 20 dogs, that's a lot different than when we have four or five hour stretches where there's 40 or 45 dogs outside. It's unbelievable, truly. Thank you. Oh, um, first timers first, if you'd. Thank you. Is there anybody else who um, has any questions? So, I, sure, come on up. How's everyone doing tonight? I am actually not in the area, so let me clear that. Um, let me clear it out of the way. And in case anyone saw me laughing, I was really laughing at myself with Sydney about a different issue. So, um, I'm here basically for educational purposes. Um, that's really why I'm here. My name is Paul Brady. I'm at 16 Church Street. And um, the reason why I'm here is because of the nuisance law is really why I'm here. So um, I get it, the decibels and everything. I'm familiar with all of that. Um, but there's a law in the books that speaks to nuisance. And, you know, you're really going to set a precedence here, which will down the line, potentially affect me. Um, there, you know, Weathersfield is a dog community, and there are, you know, many people that have dogs. We can all agree about that. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
uh, how this goes, you know, I, I, I'm begging you guys to really strongly think about this because once you let this particularly slide, and this is, I, again, nothing against the business owners. I'm glad there's businesses opening in Connecticut because every day there's one that's closing. So, um, you know, I really want you guys to strongly think about this and, you know, don't, you know, cast your vote lightly because you will be set in precedence once you, you know, if you approve this because that nuisance law, it's not about the decibels. It's really that there's a law in the book stating, you know, nuisance and the behavior pattern is nuisance. Um, you know, so that's really my thing. And, you know, I, again, asking you guys to strongly consider that. Thank you. Thank you. So with the applicant, um, so, so we are gonna ask them the questions that have been posed. If you've got a specific question that you'd like us to pose when we get them back up. Okay. Sure. Yes. Thanks. You want to do it before? You? Um, yeah, I have a question I, I would like you to ask, um, actually. Um, I know that in uh, daycare businesses, they have a certain amount of teachers per um, per, st per uh, the children that's there. So, is under um, kennel and uh, you know dog business? I don't know if there is a number. Of, you know, how many person per you know dogs? what would that be? Because mm -hmm. I, I mean, you know, I've been a dog owner. I don't currently own a dog right now, but um, I would just say, you know, you can't compare that to, let's say a dog park, because if I took my dog to a dog park, you know, and everyone in here, anyone in here, everyone in here had a dog, you know, um, there is one owner per dog. So, you know, that there's a difference there with, with the attention span, you know, um, you know, think about this room. If we had 20 kids in here, one teacher, and we're trying to do something, the attention spans are different, you know. So, you know, some may be paying attention to you, some may not be doing their own thing. So, I mean, I heard, you know, 40 dogs in, 40 dogs out in the back. How many, you know, workers are in the back with the dogs is really the question I would like you to pose and how that goes. Sure. Will do. Thank you for putting up with me. Kieran Williams, 149 Garden Street. I just want to ask uh, a general question. Um, people who come up here in support of the facility being a great facility, good people, do well with their dogs, I appreciate that. I understand it. Frankly, I'd expect it. But it shouldn't be at the expense of residents. And that's the, that's the dichotomy. You got a line here that says commercial, and then you got residential. It's not cut, it's not black and white. Commercial should not take uh, place just for dollars and cents. Should not be a determining factor over quality of life, devaluation of homes, things of this nature. The other thing I wanted to say is there's a state of Connecticut nuisance regulation, section 22-363 nuisance, and it addresses excessive barking disturbance, continual barking, you should please take a look at that because it's a state regulation in regard to nuisance. Thank you. Can I come in there? Thank you. All right. Unless there are other hands, would the applicant uh, join us? <laughs> you had to wait till the very last minute. <laughs> <laughs> and you're doing it anyway. Yeah, so I'm, doing, you're, you're I'm doing it anyway. Wow. Hi, uh, John Noel, 20 Dorchester Road. A question for the engineer here. Uh, how many dog kennels, I see your firm is a big firm. How many dog kennels have you done? So, so I'll, I'll oh, okay. we'll, That's we'll ask One him. of the questions I would like to yeah, ask, I'm, okay? But there's probably a follow-up, right? In the early part here, the attorney came up there and they said, we have good news for you. We're going to get rid of the sound. Well, in all honesty, good news for us. This operation has been involved in six months. They're doing something that's totally illegal. I don't understand why they're getting away with it. 
And if you go look at their operation right now, they put up these cheap blue tarps against the fence. They're blowing all over the place. They're supposedly tied down with string. They haven't retied them. It looks like a dump. And second time, when I speak to my neighbors, I had a lady tell me the other day she was sick. She couldn't take a, she went upstairs to go to take a nap. She couldn't do it because the dogs are so bad. Hard to believe that these dogs, Garden Street, which is a pretty good distance from these, from these guys, these people are getting inundated with this sound. And it isn't right. It should have never been approved. It wasn't approved. And they're still running a business like it's been approved. It should be shut down like tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, more, another one. You late, you late comers. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Yeah. Mike Barasa, two four eight Dale Road, and thank you for listening to this. Um, you know, everyone's entitled uh, to their, give their thoughts, and I sympathize with the people that live around Wag Time. But I heard all these comments about the cousins, Brian. <clears throat> And, you know, just, I wasn't going to talk, but that last comment about the type of business and attacking him, and I, I, other people have said that they want him to succeed, succeed. He's not a bad person. They talked about fraud. Yeah, maybe the application was incomplete, but I know Brian, and, and he's generally a good person, and if the application was screwed up, you know, he, to listen to the attorney, Brian laid down on everything in order to keep the business to survive. That's the type of businesses I want in the, in the uh, community. Now, <clears throat> I have the flexibility of dropping the dog off every day because of my line of work. I drop off at different times. They give me the flexibility to drop off because we only do half days, twice a week and we do it for socializing the dogs with other dogs. So when they're around small children, other dogs, there are no issues. <clears throat> now I gotta tell you, and I'm, I'm not downplaying the neighborhood because I believe there's times that it, it is bad there. And, uh, but there's a lot of times when I drop off, there's more noise coming from the post office across the street because although my wife is a dog lover, I'm not. We own the dog. <laughs> hey, I'm gonna call it how it is. I like my dog, but I'm not a dog lover. <clears throat> I'm gonna call it how it is. But they do an excellent job there, and I'm skeptical. So I, you know, Brian probably could see it on a camera. I don't know if he has a camera. I sneak around the corner, make sure my dog's doing okay. And the only time they, that I hear a lot, a lot of loud barking is when they see me. Other than that, there's more noise coming from Weathersfield Small Engine, which is a great company. There's more noise coming from the post office with the traffic and the door slamming and the apartment building next to it. There's more noise, and this is gonna come out bad, but I'm gonna say it, that the funeral home, when there was a funeral, there was more noise with car doors shut and, and I'm not talking bad about them, but I'm just comparing noise. So I did my own due diligence and went around the neighborhood just because I found out what was going on, just to listen. Now, it's not all the time that I'm there, so I sympathize with what you're saying. I really do. But for Brian to lay down and do everything that is being asked for, I think it has to take some serious consideration uh, to help out a business that wants to thrive. So that's it, thank you. So, so I failed to ask uh, the other individual who spoke in favor, but I'll ask you as the third person. What is it, why is it that you go there? Is it, is it the convenience <coughs> of the location? It was, uh, well that's part of it. Uh, two, we've been to a lot of other uh, kennels in the neighborhood, I mean in the, in the vicinity, Glastonbury, yep. on the Berlin Turnpike, and it's, in my opinion, are not as well run. I don't think the dogs are as cared. I know you had a comment on uh, ratios, 
Um, there's been times I've been uh, at WAG time where <clears throat> anywhere from, uh, I could say, six to ten employees. Now, the beauty of going to WAG time is, you know, Robin and I will look at the weather report. If it's raining or it's, it's too cold or too hot, we have the flexibility of not bringing the dog that day. Now, most other kennels, you have to make a reservation for that day, and you're committed whether you show up or not. Uh, unless you give an advance notice that you can, cannot make it. But uh, the training that they do and temporary boarding. Uh, every so often we'll, we'll board, um, you know, usually if we're at an event late at night. But I think the people are class, class acts. The trainers there is, is class, and Brian has a heart of gold. And I, haven't, I didn't know Brian until about six months ago or eight months ago, whenever we started going there. So... <clears throat> When I hear him being attacked, that's unfair. It, you could attack the business and maybe how the application was done, but the man is a good man. And when I hear some of these people say that, that's dead wrong. And the big guy, that was great, you apologizing. That was awesome. You're a good man. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, so would the applicant uh, join us again? So, so I have uh, like four basic questions that the uh, that the public has asked, and if you could uh, address those, um, you probably made your own notes, right? Um, so let's go to the easy ones. How many dogs were in the yard when the noise study was performed? As in the outdoor area, there were forty-five. There were uh, Brian said there were fifty-five at the f facility that day, so some were inside. Okay. Um, May I also add to that that uh, we specifically picked uh, a day, I think you said Monday and Tuesdays were the busiest days, so we tried to do it on one of those days. I believe it was a Tuesday. Thank you. Uh, is there a threshold-ish for the number of staff, or is it a s standard number of staff, and if 30 come in, the ratio is high, and if there's 65, the ratio is half that? They find that they typically have three people outside with the dogs. There's no requirement um, they're just uh, uh, knowledgeable enough to know what works and keeps the dogs under control and um, seems to allow enough people out there. So if some dogs have to go in, they when dogs do bark, they try and take the dogs inside and separate them out from the ones that are quietly playing. When I was there, um, I went up to the fence. Uh, there were that number of people outside. Uh, probably three dogs came up and started barking as I approached the fence to view them while they were playing back there. But there were a lot of other dogs lounging on equipment and just sort of, you know, enjoying being outdoors. So when I went inside, there were, I would say, ten dogs that were in a small room when I went inside and very close quarters, but the person there said, well, these dogs had been barking, so we brought them in. So that's what they feel is a sufficient number to make it work out for them outside. Okay. Uh, and on the premises, there can be anywhere from, I don't know, six to eight people, but mostly six, full, uh, six attendants and one permanent person at the desk. In fact, their mother often works there at the desk. It's a really a family operation. Okay, so I, I appreciate the fact that you started outside because you're right, that's what matters most, three-ish outside. Yeah. Thank you. So so let me just finish the other uh, public's question. So there were, there were two more, and they pretty much go to the uh, acoustic gentleman. Um, so how many kennels have you done? That's the, and, but, you know, that'll take a second. So can you discuss the differences in the elevation that was posed by Mr. Williams that – you know, the site is higher, the wall is up near the top, presumably, and folks down below? Sure. So, um, I mean, the, the, the slope is not great. I don't know the exact slope, um, but I guess the engineer is there tomorrow morning to, to get a, uh, uh, a better survey. Um, if we were to make the wall 10 feet at, um, at that, uh, I guess that's the east side of the property, um, even if we're to stay level and uh, the rest of it, my, my recommendation originally was an eight foot wall anyway. So even if it were to go slightly down, uh, we just have to make sure that it's, um, that it's over 
eight feet the entire way, but I would imagine it's it's not even that big of a slope. So um, the, the wall is laid out on the plans. It looks like it's being proposed several feet outside of the chain link fence, right? So you can, so it's gonna be, you know, no more than a two to one. It's going you right. know, three yeah. or four feet down. It's no more than a foot lower, right? Mm -hmm. So it's nine feet up probably, right? I would, I would imagine, but um, Ish. I'd need to survey that. Yeah. So those are the questions that I heard from the public. George? Oh, I'm sorry. It's right, the, the, the first and easy one, right? Uh, so I, I have not done any kennels before. Right. Um, I will say, though, that uh, I have done noise control for um, a huge variety of, of things from uh, outdoor generators, um, air handler units, um, uh, generators that kick up that have a very loud impulse that we need to um, that we need to control um, to stay within noise codes and, and make sure neighbors are happy um, to uh, controlling toilet noise and um, I've, I've done a variety of uh, different noise sources um, I, under, I have a very good understanding of how sound propagates um, and uh, I, I am fully confident that um, that our solution is is going to be effective, um, regardless of, of whether I've uh, done a specific study on a dog. I've also um, I've also done uh, outside research on um, uh, read other other reports on kennels, other uh, noise um, complaints regarding dogs and, and how to attenuate them. So I, I have a very high level of confidence that uh, that this solution is uh, is going to be effective. I guess just to follow up on that, it, as a general matter, is is the noise from a dog different in any scientific way from other kinds of noise? Um, so in terms of the way it propagates, uh, no. But in terms of the way that a human will perceive it, um, you know, it, it is different than a uh, you know a constant hum of a generator. Um, it's a little. It's going to be a little more close to the to the impulse, uh, you know, or something that uh, when an air handler kicks on, um, something similar to that, uh, with uh, with different frequencies. But that's what you designed to, right? That exactly. To, to the, yes. To the peak, right? To the, to the peak. To, yeah. To that. To in the the entire time we were measuring, we took the absolute loudest point in that measurement, and uh, and that's what we designed it to. So yes. George. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The owner, um, if this were not approved, would you and or could you continue to operate without an outdoor venue? Not until the police committee does. That's what I meant, in its no. current location. No. Okay. Thank you. And for the record, um, that was Jeffrey Cousins that answered that. Thank you. Um, one of the neighbors had a question, which I'd like to hear from your noise consultant on, which is, is there some kind of covering that could be put on the brick wall at the rear of the building, and would that have some beneficial effect? Uh, I, I believe that that would not have uh, any effect. Why, on, why is that? Um, so the the majority the, the the reflection that's coming off of of the building, um, I would say that there there probably is some, um, but uh, a brick is actually a, a very good absorber of noise. Um, so having that brick building, uh, it is going to absorb a decent amount of noise, surprisingly so. Um, and uh, even subjectively, as I was standing there, um, if you hear a dog bark, especially an impulse like that. Uh, you should be able to hear the dog and then its reflection right back um, from being on site, hearing those, uh, hearing the, the dog's bark. I, I did not pick up on that. Um, and uh, in my professional opinion, even if you were to totally eliminate uh, that reflection, I don't think that reflection is, uh, is significant in any way. Um, and I, I, I don't believe that, that that putting absorption on that on that wall would um, would uh, benefit um, the the you know you, you know increase the uh, the um, isolation in any way. Okay, and two, two other or one and a half uh, quick 
questions just to throw into the mix for the applicant to consider. Um, again, trying to think of different ways to bridge some, some of the issues here. Um, from the owner's perspective, we've heard about early morning startups with dogs outside. Um, could, could you start later in terms of uh, the morning hours to try to address some of what we've heard? Um, adjust your hours and related to that, do you have the ability to perhaps adjust the number of dogs that might be out at a given time and have a lesser number of dogs at, at peak times? I have uh, asked our consultant whether or not the number of dogs at any given time makes a big difference. And what I've had back, and I would ask him to confirm, is that it's not a significant difference in terms of the number of dogs that could be barking at, at a given time. In response to your question, would you like to put that on the record? Yes, yeah. Um, if, if you, uh, even if you were to um, double the amount of dogs barking uh, simultaneously, you will only get a three decibel increase, which uh, as I explained before, is uh, something that's noticeable, but it's uh, not significant. But getting back to that, I, you've got a number of letters and you've heard from a few people today about the convenience aspects of the hours that are in effect for utilization of the daycare facility. Those are drop off and pick up um, hours. It does open early enough for people who go to work early to drop their dog off. If you start raising that I'm not time of the day. I'm not suggesting changing the hours of drop off. I'm suggesting when they go outside, they stay inside for the first hour, hour and a half, whatever the, the hours happen to be before they go out. My response to that would be that if they're not going out until 8 in the morning and our acoustical designer has come up with something that controls the sound anyway, then it really shouldn't make a difference whether the dog goes out at 8 or 9 if people aren't going to be able to hear it. Now, I have suggested that um, we would, would be amenable to coming back and doing some testing or looking at this after a while. And if I, I'm expecting there's not going to be an issue, but maybe that's something we could look up at at that point. But I'm not sure it makes a difference if we were to limit when they could go out in the morning in terms of having any effect on the neighborhood. There is either an effect or there's not. If this fixes it, then it doesn't matter if it's 8 in the morning or 9 in the morning or 10 in the morning that the dogs are able to go out. If it doesn't fix it, then it is an issue, but I think there are other things that have to be done. Um, we agree 100% that it's important to have a thriving business. They have a very good operation going, but it can't be a business that causes you know, some of the pain that we've heard about tonight. I don't think it's unreasonable to think that they should find a way of fixing that situation. And I do believe, based on what I've heard from our consultant, that we can do that. And we should. Yes, Tom? I, I just have one clarification to, to seek. Uh, going back to uh, uh, the discussion a few minutes ago regarding the topography of the land. Uh, um, from what I was gathering, uh, the height of the, of the site where the, uh, the, the dog walk, dog park, uh, or, or enclosure is located is about uh, four feet or so higher than uh, the, the topography of the land area uh, of the residential area surrounding it. Is that correct? And if the, and if the uh, sound <coughs> wall that uh, is proposed is constructed, then the, you know, counting the, the height of the wall, which is now 10 feet, as I understand it, 
it would be about 14 feet above the, uh, the <laughs> residential area in terms of uh, uh, well, land and improvements of both areas. What is the effect by having the area being higher than the, the, the area of the business higher than the residential area? What, what's the effect upon the sound carrying and distance and so forth? Yeah, that, that, will, um, that will have a positive effect on the amount of isolation that the wall provides. Um, uh, I, I would need to actually run it in, in my model again, but uh, I would imagine it'd be somewhere in the order of uh, an additional one to two decibels. Okay, so having it higher is better than if it, uh, having the site higher than the residential area is better for the residential area as opposed to if the site was lower than the residential area in terms of sound carrying. Once the fence is up. <coughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So so I haven't heard anybody ask whether the applicant, and, and it's, it's not going to be for the sound guy, has the applicant considered a, an enclosure of some sort? Though I guess this is going to speak to the sound guy. An enclosure would do better, would it not? A full enclosure? If you put, you know, a cover on the thing, and maybe it's not a enclosed building, but the walls, if they're solid, are going to, you know, perform the same thing, and a roof over it, maybe or maybe not. You know, I'm thinking like a horse corral, you know, that tends to be open and it's cold. And is that going to be a better solution? And did the applicant consider that? Is that just like so expensive? Because I really don't have a feel for it. So start with you. Would it be better? Uh, yes. Yeah. In theory, it, it right? would be better. It, it, yeah. In your in your opinion, uh, would it be measurable? Um, Noticeable? Well, yes, it, it wouldn't be too much better if, you know, if you had uninsulated walls and just sort of put up planks like that. You know, if we were talking about a building where it's got yeah. studs and insulation and all that kind of stuff, um, then be obviously that's that's kind of, uh, well, then they're not, they're not outside anymore. Um, <laughs> if, uh, if you were to put it in a barn without insulation um, and just put wood, wood slats, it's going to be similar, yeah, no, not, not too much better than, than what we're um, than what we're proposing here. Um, putting a roof on is just going to help sound uh, not, not go over the barrier. Over, right? um, but uh, there is a limit to the, you know, it's not the, the, the sound that, there, there is gonna be sound that makes it through the barrier and there's gonna be sound that makes it over the barrier. And you have to add both of those levels um, to get a proper level at whatever the receiver location is. Um, so if you take a roof, you get rid of one of those, but you're still gonna have some sound that makes it through a wall just like you know, every wall that exists, you know, if I scream loud enough, I'm going to get through this wall. Um, uh, so it would help, but it's not going to be a significant um, change. Thank you. In terms of, uh, has the applicant considered it? Um, no. no. It, it's not anything we've considered. Uh, a lot of the allure of the business is to have an outdoor play area. The dogs are outdoors, although you've heard that sometimes those dogs don't want to be out when it's too cold or it's mm. too rainy. But that is part of what they enjoy at that facility. So, so I mean, basically what you'd be proposing is expanding the building and keeping the dogs inside. Just so they have not At some level, that. right. At, it, at some level, that's kind of what, I'm, but though I'm actually thinking more like a horse corral that doesn't have full enclosure, et cetera. Um, but... I'm going to show my hand and say I asked these questions of the proponents for a reason, and not one of them said, well, it's because, because they're, they're the only one with an open play yard. Not one of them. So convenience, I get it, right? If it's right here, you can drop them off. That, that, I get that. But how do we make it more palatable to everybody else who's around it? I think only, and I would say one thing. I thought about that because I assumed that was where your questioning was going when you asked them but I'm not quite sure that they understand what the, what was at stake or what the distinction was Fair between enough. it. And but there it were only two that you asked. And I, you know, if some yeah. of them are still here, I suppose you could ask whether <laughs> that's something that they would want, a place where you couldn't let your dogs get outside. But in any event, I, I appreciate what you were you know, seeking, and I, I just don't think they understood that you were suggesting 
as to whether or not being outdoors had anything to do with whether or not this was a viable place for their animal. Yeah. So, um, so let's talk a moment to commission about um, the fact that it arguably has to go through another commission for a review, if, if not necessarily legally something that we have to wait for. Um, we've heard some, some thoughts. I, I know, at least in terms of a, the layout of the wall, there was or at least an option they were going to consider, and at least I, I think I got the applicant to suggest they were going to consider um, a, a third side to the wall, et cetera, and how that might play out. I guess where I'm heading here is are, are, we, are we of the opinion that we're going to extend the, the uh, hearing um, to another meeting and get some more information, or are others comfortable with what we've heard and ready to make a call? Before we decide from our standpoint, can we ask the applicant if they're looking for more time to look into things even Fair enough. before we... Uh, yeah, we did actually hear that uh, there might be a reason for them. We have, uh, is it one, two, three, four, five? <laughs> um, I don't have a problem with having it go over to another meeting. Um, if more members are here, that's probably a better situation and would encourage if anybody else comes that isn't here tonight that certainly they have to listen to the record and look at it. Uh, we would have more definitive potentially uh, maybe I should look to Peter. Would we have gone to the wetland meeting by the time this board meets again? My understanding is um, if um, your engineer gets the application in tomorrow, when uh, they Wednesday meet? of next week is the oh, meeting. Okay. So we well, would have something. So, so and, and our next meeting is so so far. It's so it's still scheduled for Tuesday next week, which you know, oh. nobody here is going to be overly thrilled with. So we're probably all going to want to cancel it. Um, because this one was late, um, and and moved two weeks from then, right? So then, so it would be December third after that. Our contractor is scheduled for is it December second to put the wall up? It's fourth. Nope. Okay. <laughs> I will tell you why. Because we wanted to make sure that if it was approved, we would be able to get it in as quickly as possible for you, so that whatever you're enduring now it would have a limited time period. So that is the answer, and that is the truth. Thank you. Um, so I guess with that, and, but before Kevin goes, he had one other comment he wanted to make, if he could put it on the record, regarding decibels and nuisance. Yeah, so there were, there were a lot of good points brought up um, uh, by, by a lot of you who, who said um, uh, that it was a nuisance issue and not a decibel issue, and I can totally appreciate that. Uh, what I will say is that, uh, um, you know, I, I can't tell you that uh, a dog barking at 55 decibels is, go is not going to be a nuisance because nuisances are uh, subjective by their nature. Um, uh, what I can tell you, though, is that um, a, a 20 decibel reduction in dogs barking um, is we are addressing the issue. I know I can talk about it because I'm an acoustic engineer. I can talk about it in decibels, and um, and that's the math, and that's what my calculator outputs. Uh, but that is uh, a significant reduction in noise. And, and so I understand decibels may not mean uh, anything to anyone except for, for me because I, uh, you know, pay my bills with them. Uh, but... Um, we are addressing both the decibel and the nuisance issue uh, by introducing uh, this acoustic barrier. Thanks. Okay. Have you got another question? No? Hand up in the floor. Please. Yeah, I know. I'm trying to figure out how to deal with it. Um, if you'll just bear with me, it, it may be a moot point, right? Um, so what is the commission feeling about uh, extending? Well, actually, I do. I, yeah, just one question is, if it does get extended, it's essentially operations as is until then. Like that's the only option. Like we can't make any kind of suggestion. Uh, 
I don't know what your suggestions are, so I can't really uh, answer your question. But operational suggestions, I assume. Correct. Yeah. Such uh, as limiting the number of dogs that are outside for a month. Such as, I don't know. I'm I'm just trying to see because it's we're extending it and it's it's good because we're going over all the different options that we could just to make sure that we're going to have the correct product in the end or solution I should say at the end but in the meantime the the nuisance complaints are going to continue yeah. so I'm just trying to yeah, I, I, some sort of olive, olive branch. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm wondering it's not, it would be nothing I, I'm guessing it's nothing more than just you know something that the owner would willingly do right right yeah. Yeah. and I'm and I understand the science behind half the dogs doesn't necessarily make it that much quieter but maybe we can identify a few dogs that are like <laughs> I will tell you that the owner is intent on minimizing any discomfort and issue until we can get that fence up assuming you approve the application but I'm sure they will redouble their efforts and make sure that you know staff is on top of it as much as is humanly possible with regard to those dogs to keep them as quiet as possible before the continued hearing one recommendation I would have for the owner is that there a number of people spoke about uh, the times at which the uh, uh, the dogs were outside in the area that seemed to be at variance from the hours that are stated in the procedures sheet that you uh, passed out to the commission. So if the if the owner would uh, definitely commit to those hours that he stated in you know, in, in in the record, uh, and adhere to that. Uh, in in the meantime, I I would tend to think that would be uh, a, a considerable gesture of goodwill relating to uh, the complaints of uh, the neighborhood that we've heard tonight. Uh, no question, they will do that. And I didn't mention this before, but you know there are other dogs that do bark. And I know my client has been a little frustrated sometimes when he gets blamed for other people's dogs, although I don't diminish at all the fact that these dogs, as our sound study indicated, generate a noise level that is not acceptable at times. Um, I did get an email from um, Brian on November 3rd saying that I just want to for inform you that today, Sunday, 11 319 at 515 a.m. real time after clocks went back an hour. I went to the daycare to let in the painters and finish some paperwork. We had no dogs there since we were painting the kennels and doing the fall air cleaning and fogging. And at 537 a.m. for almost 40 minutes, there was a barking dog nonstop coming from the behind the closed fence area, which appeared to be to the right of our building. But it was not from them. I mean, it's a, I'm just suggesting that there are other dogs who are out in the morning that may be barking that aren't necessarily happening here. But I also commit, because I know they will commit to it and have committed to it, those dogs will not be out before the time period that they have indicated in that protocol. I, 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 you know, I hear what you're saying, and I fully understand that having been a dog owner myself and in the neighborhoods that I've lived various areas of the country during my life that uh, uh, I've had neighbors with dogs that uh, have certainly uh, uh, disturbed, you know, my, my peace and quiet and enjoyment of my own uh, property, which proved to be impossible while you know, those dogs were out, you know, that, that were blown to my neighbors. And so it does happen. We, we're, we're very canine friendly people and so there's millions of uh, uh, you know, of such animals in the country and uh, uh, it, you know stuff happens so and so I appreciate the, uh, you know any good faith efforts that your your clients uh, can, we can are offer and we recognize you know it's not 
the vote that there's a lot that's beyond their control, even if the whole thing was enclosed uh, and everything was in a building. There'd still be some, you know, noise coming from other animals, you know, throughout the town. Thank you. So I posed a question before, does anybody have a strong opinion one way or the other about leaving the, the hearing open or? Oh, I'm, I'm become I'm familiar enough with the situation to vote next time. So I'm, I'm not at all yeah. concerned. You know, I'm not at all concerned about somebody getting up to speed with the <laughs> with the topic. I'm, I'm really asking: Are you, are you in a position where you, you know you've heard enough and can make a call tonight? That's really what it boils down to, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, if if I felt that by having another session, the applicant was going to be able to come back to us and comment further on some of the issues we've discussed, maybe have some additional ideas or adjustments on some of the ones we've already heard about. Yep. I, for one, would feel that would be worthwhile because I'd rather have more information if there's any chance of further answering some of these questions or you know, coming up with some, some adjustments. But you know, if it's yes, if it, if it's going to be the same thing with nothing more so, than so, what do you think? You're, wh what are we waiting for then? You know, what are we going to hear next time? So there's a discussion about wrapping around the third side. Well, right, and it sounds like they have an easement or so utility to... company. Maybe they can get some more information on whether that's going to be a non-starter or not. That would be helpful to know if they could. Um, yeah, and what and, was and their concern that the third wall? wasn't going to be Th that's viable. The like well the third wall that, would be was helpful. Was that the access? Was that the utility access side? Yes. Yes. No. yes. Yeah. no, I thought it was the uh, Yeah, I misunderstood. I thought it was the utility access side, but it's the other side I think you're talking about. Someone asked it was the south side. The south side, that's where there's a vetted, fence now. To find out if that's even possible. Well, on on the south side you have the utility. Right? And on the north side, there's actually a gap. It doesn't close all the way to the building, right? Right. right. Which I didn't hear anybody talking about right. specifically, but I, I understood the issue on the third side was yeah. on the south side, right? Yeah, right. The only thing I can say with regard to that is um, you know, everybody who is here tonight cares about what's happening on the residential side. And if we get an approval, we can immediately put up the fence and solve the residential problem. Uh, I just ask Kevin whether or not adding a fence, adding more along the south side would make a difference. And he said, mm, well, yeah, it could, I think he said, but it's not going to have any difference to the neighbors. It's not going to make an effect to the, to to the everyone who's here tonight. To the, to the neighbors. Correct. But that's we're, we're talking about the now the neighbors to the south right there. Business neighbors, but right. my understanding is the business neighbors to the south are there are no issues. They, they are in the business neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So okay. And well. if I might note that it might be possible to you know if there are still issues after this is done, I, we are amenable to having a look back, if you will, to have us come back if, it, if it's not working to the satisfaction of neighbors, certainly uh, uh, going in that direction, but also if there are concerns that have been raised by people on the other side. I'm not getting any defi definitive answers. Uh, so there, this gentleman did want to add something, so I'm going to let him speak, and the hearing is still open, so okay. if you would, please. Thank and you. And really, whatever way you decide to go is acceptable to us, whether you close it tonight and vote or whether you hold off to the next meeting. It's All right. Thank you. Thank you. I would just like to reiterate that there is no decibel criteria in section 70-3 of the town's ordinance for nuisance. 
no decibels. So you may lower the decibels to some significant level, but the, the constant barking of the dogs creates an annoyance that is such that this town felt it was important to draft its own legislation, its own regulation to cover nuisance. And <clears throat> in all this discussion, it was only Commissioner Allard that used the word nuisance in any comment or any question. Not one question or comment that came from the commission included the word nuisance. So I know it's, and Mr. Gillespie made this clear a while back, that enforcing and, and, and monitoring our nuisance regulation has nothing to do with PZC, and I get that. But our recourse has been trying to go to the, to the ACA, the, the animal control officer, the police, town manager Evans, town council, Mayor Bellows, to try to get resolution to this, and the, every single one of them points to PZC, every single one of them, says we have to go through the PZC process. Okay, so there, here's, here we are, this is our recourse, and we have, we have over 40 people in this community that are very disturbed by this, and we're, 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 I'm feeling right now that we're not getting heard on the issue of nuisance, because this, this, this matter of decibels and noise ordinance has, is nothing to us. We need to address the issue of nuisance. And, and right now we've been told that you're our recourse. You're, our, you're the people that we need to go to. In, in spite of Mr. Gillespie's comment that this is not a PZC issue. Okay, so I'm a lo we're lost. So. Sure, we've heard you already. You're repeating yourself. Okay. All right, all right, I am repeating myself and I apologize for that. Uh, but please think and use the word nuisance in, in, in some of your, your discussion about this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, Dave McCormick again from 143 Garden Street. I just want on the record that this is a seven day a week operation. We talk about play time, it's also stay time, it's play and stay. There are dogs there seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So that includes Sunday, includes Saturday evening. So looking at this through the scope of what their play hours are, isn't the full picture of what the problem is. It's a seven day a week issue. I just want that on the record, thank you. Thanks. I have two questions, actually. Uh, I was wondering if you, the commission could probably ask the applicant, what's the um, capacity for the building for the, um, the kennel? If you could ask that question. I think we heard that, 65. Uh, that's 65? Okay, um, okay. And the, uh, my next question is, um, are there any specific laws um, as far as the town code goes? as it relates to dog dare cares, um, no. So this is just, yeah, I'll know. Okay, all right, that's the question. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's no, <laughs> yes, no, we're good. Um, just for the record, I just want to say that, um, and I'm piggybacking on what Mr. Harley said, um, we bring our dog to uh, wag time because we want her outside at times during the day when no one's home. When we're at work, we want her to have some outdoor time. And the other thing is, although it's not in direct relation, and um, I understand the nuisance situation, um, I hear cannons going off Saturday and Sunday mornings up on, um, I live near D Ridge Road. Um, I know the cannons are going off to scare away the scarecrows in the meadows, so I've been told I can hear them every weekend. And the other thing is, what about the train? Love the train. Okay, <laughs> so I, I can hear the train up by where I live. I know it doesn't have um, a regular schedule. It is loud. We can hear the warning sound. We can hear the chugging. So. 
there is different levels of noises coming from different situations. I just would like to make that point. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I hear a train whistle too, but I think it's Newington's. Yeah, I hear that. I know, I know. So, oh, somebody different. Uh, yeah, somebody different, right? Hi, thank you for hearing me. I'm Danette Disbro from Ridge Road. And it's been my experience um, with my dog. I've had a dog in the past that we've gone to other daycares. There is not a daycare in the area, West Hartford or Newington, that doesn't offer outside playscape area. So in West Hartford, there's Uber Dog and there is also um, Planet Bark. They both offer outside. Connecticut Canine offers outside. So I believe to be competitive, outside is part of the makeup of being a play care area. It's important. And that, as a dog owner, I look for that because otherwise my dog can stay home <laughs> and be inside all day. So that's just my experience from other, from other play care er, places. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I know. One last time, Mr. Williams. <laughs> Who's Brian over there? You? You must be a hell of a guy because they love you. Okay. Um, we have no problem with the operation and what they offer. I believe everybody that, who has cheered on Brian and, and WAG time, I, I think that's great. They don't live where we live. Ridge Road, Dale Road, it's not Garden Street, our area. They don't put up with seven days a week and uh, the lawyer said, <clears throat> you know, could be an occasional dog. Yeah, could be. I have a couple. However, the noise you'll hear from wag time is not an occasional single dog. That noise is so different. <laughs> There's no question where it's coming from. Uh, my last comment is I haven't heard the engineer or the lawyer say, this will work. We think it will. We hope it will. You know, let's try it and see what happens. And if it doesn't work, we can come back. What about us? Do we still go on putting up with the trial period, the comeback period? So uh, in closed, I'd ask the engineer, if you use the same material, and you don't have to make that playpen as big as it is. They don't use it all. If you use the same material for four walls, you said if we put the wall, if I'm correct, I'm asking, I, but I have to ask to you, I guess, that noise can go over the wall. You illustrated that a number of times. There still will be noise, and it comes right up our backyards. If you enclose the roof and you have four sides, I don't know where, where, where a lot of noise is going to be able to escape to go up. So. They can't tell us it'll work. His figures, computations are like, say it might or it will improve, but will it meet the nuisance requirement? And that's the key issue. And I'll promise you, well, I shouldn't. I have highly suspicious thoughts that says how much of a change it would be. And I guess I think my last thought is, could you put absorbent material if he doesn't think it should go on a brick wall as opposed to the three or four other engineers who said that would help, would it help if we had those on the three walls? Thank you. And thank you very much, seriously. All right, so I will entertain a motion on the hearing since nobody is giving me their definitive thoughts on it. Mm -hmm. I'll make a motion to extend the hearing. Thank you. All right. So, um, if we were to do so, um, I'd be inclined to be looking for what their thoughts are on the third side at a minimum, maybe some ideas further about more absorptive materials, those type of things. That's what I would do, and I think I'm showing my hand that I would prefer to extend the hearing 
by asking that. I would expect the applicant to address all of the, any of the outstanding issues we've discussed tonight and have answers. Yeah, so, so they're kind of nebulous though, yeah, right? Yeah, because I'm curious about the survey's impact on the height of the wall, depending on, you know, if we're two feet higher in the mid area of the play area, maybe we'd go to 12 or something at the bottom, like keep it level or something. So there's like, there's a couple questions that I have, because that's how you design a highway wall. Right. You figure out the crown of the highway and you put it 16 or so feet above. So, I mean, that's I the science that we use. I, I agree with what everybody, and Tom and um, Ryan, in terms of what you want to, what you'd like to see. And I guess I would add to that, if we're going to come back to another hearing, you know, the applicant had indicated that, I think they said they were confident this would work, but if it didn't, there were other things they could look into. And I guess I'd like to know, what are those other things that you potentially could do if there were still an issue, rather than just generally stating you'd do something, I'd like to know what would those next steps be? How would they work? What would they involve? And what would you expect that they would do further to mitigate the noise? Thank you. Um, for me, one of the important things would be, you know, with any kind of, of approval that we would have, that we would include as a condition that the applicant would come back to us, you know, six months later or so with a supplemental, uh, you know, report that would detail, uh, would give us details as to how successful what's been implemented has been mm -hmm. relative to, you know, the overall issue that, that. Tom, uh, that would be part of the motion, wouldn't it? That would be part of the motion, but I'm just For playing my hand that that, I, that's a, I think. A, that's a, a given if we, if we get there, me, so. if we get there next time, right? Not right. Right. So. I think I already had that count, but would, you know, are you in agreement? I'd, I'd approve it an extension. Okay. That, that seems reasonable. Yeah, I mean, and, and I guess the, the one thing that would be helpful to me, and I, I think it's probably kind of a scientific thing, is, you know, we've talked about, you know, people on opposite sides of the wall and sound going over the wall, whether there's any way to just estimate what, if any, effect that wall would have on the level of the sound going over to the houses on Dorchester? Because I think they're probably, you know, Tom said four feet. I, I'm guessing it's probably more like eight or ten feet higher than Beaver Road, which is kind of down in the ditch. Um, and, you know, if through some scientific effort you know it, it could be shown that if you know if it's 39 over there now it would be 29 afterward um you know that would at least get me in the direction of being more comfortable that not only have we dealt with you know the noise ordinance which i you know basically see as a requirement um, but at least it would give us some comfort that it would mitigate the nuisance aspect of it too. Um, you know, and I, and I guess the flip side of it is, you know, it, if, if it would have no effect at all on that, you know, are, are we just kind of, you know, fooling ourselves into thinking that, you know, putting up a 14 foot high wall is going to make a difference in how many dogs you can hear a quarter mile away when that sound just kind of travels through the mists rather than in a straight line. And I, you know, frankly, I, I have no idea whether that kind of analysis is even possible. But if it is, I'd be curious to know what it shows. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of that whole distance issue, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, it, it, you have one kind of noise when your next door neighbor is mowing his lawn and you have a different kind of noise when somebody three houses away is running the weed whacker that's going on and off and on and off, and somebody five houses away has a barking dog. You know, some of them are more of a nuisance than others, and, and it's inherently subjective. But, um, you know, I think if, if, there's, if there's some kind of scientific evidence that the, you know, the sheer volume of sound wave intensity 
or whatever decibels are, um, you know, would be affected at that distance by such a fence that, you know, it, it would, it should give us more comfort that this isn't just kind of a pointless exercise. <clears throat> I think what Butch said is, is, is true. And the fact is that the term nuisance is so vague that what is nuisance to one person is not a nuisance to another. And there needs to be some kind of a definition and for me to say it's a nuisance. I need to know what I'm talking about, what's, what constitutes a nuisance. And uh, we really have to rely on expert testimony for that because unfortunately we're not there seven days a week. And we can do the best we can to, to make that interpretation. Okay. We have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Tom. All those in favor say aye. 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 So what we didn't talk about before we took the motion was when, but I guess we did say in the record, right? Ten, ten I mean, December, December 3rd. December, Tuesday. December, Tuesday. Okay. You're not going to get into self-storage, are you? So thank you very much, everybody, for participating. I just realized that we have to. Sure. <laughs> you can. I hope not. <laughs> yeah, look at the facility. You came from something else. <laughs> I'll, I'll make a motion on the minutes. You want to get that on the one? No? Yeah. <coughs> oh, yeah. Make a motion. The minutes are perfect. <laughs> <laughs> they are. I found no errors. You found no errors. No errors. You're right. All right. Who seconded? I did. Second. Rich seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <laughs> Staff reports. So the only thing about the self-storage that I wanted to mention is we had made a commitment to study the issue further and uh, assess what our regulations might be. There are a couple of people on the EDIC who are willing to uh, participate in that process. Obviously, this uh, ultimately will have to be reviewed again by this commission. So I wanted to know if uh, there were members who wanted to contribute to that uh, process uh, by having a couple of meetings to talk about it, find out what other towns are doing, and come to some for self for the self storage moratorium. So Tom Tom Dean is interested in that. Any other folks? Yeah, I'll try it. Rich, okay. And that's probably fine. I don't want anyone who accuses of having you know meetings and you know assemblages and that kind of thing outside of the uh, Freedom of Information Act so I think two people would be uh, would be fine great thank you um, so when we come on the third besides this one we will also have the same one three one again yeah and there's a potential for something else maybe coming in but um, which I think we would we would, would be fine <coughs> Uh, motion to adjourn. Oh, does Tom want to say anything in public? Tom, time? do you want to say anything? Congratulations. If we give you more honor, uh, you can come up here. All those in favor of adjournment say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So everybody hold on to your packets, take them with you so that we don't have to replicate this the next time around. Thank you.